It's an absolutely sensational September day here at Phillip Island in Victoria. A couple of hours southeast of Melbourne driving, and you arrive at this amazing circuit. I mean, you run out of words when you view it, especially from above, but it's looking a treat today. We've got wonderful weather. It's a 500 kilometres race, 28 cars, so double that for the amount of drivers, and 113 laps is the figure around here. The breeze at the moment, as you can tell by the flags, there is facing into them as they look down the front straight, Gardner Straight, named after the former Australian motorcycle world champion, Wayne Gardner. So the forecast was for 17 degrees today. It's 26 at the moment. I said earlier, I'd hate to be a weather forecaster in this part of the world. And Neil Crompton has already touched on the amount of pressure that is in the hands of the non-regular drivers who are partnered with guys who are in the championship chase. So just a reminder of the championship picture for you. Jamie Wincup leads by 108 points now from Craig Lowndes because there were points up for grabs yesterday in qualifying. Shane Van Gisbergen third, Rick Kelly and Gartan to make up the top five. But this circuit is a true races circuit. We break it down to 12 turns. Yeah, it's a great racetrack, Matthew, and we've detailed that several times this weekend. A little under four and a half kilometres, 12 corners, an average speed of just on 175 kilometres an hour. Quite low throttle percentages around here for the wide open throttle. You spend a lot of time turning the car. That translates into tyre wear. That's why everybody's talking about this thing called tyre degradation. The wind, yesterday the flags were spot on in the animation there. Today they're the other way around. It's actually a little breeze coming from the south and southwest. That's looking up towards the north, up towards Melbourne and Port Phillip Bay. It's amazing, Cromley, when you speak to the drivers, especially after some of the sessions earlier today where the wind was quite strong, it's amazing to think how much of a difference a breeze can play in the performance of a V8 oh, supercar. It's huge. Uh, when you go down to turn one here with a tailwind, you've got to manage your braking reference there far more carefully. You've got more pace, obviously. Uh, when you come into turn four with the headwind, um, it, it's, it's again a different treatment of the way the car behaves. You even feel it here, particularly in open wheel cars, you feel it mid-corner, uh, through the last corner, all the way through turns two and three. So, And typically it's been exposed to the weather down here and we've seen evidence of, of that over the years. It's a great racetrack, you've got to learn to understand how to read it. And uh, that'll be actually something that a few of them have got to scratch their heads about today. All right, here's the Fuso grid for you. Davison and Yulden pole position against Tander and Nick Perkat. So Yulden and Perkat will start. Shane Van Gisbergen and John McIntyre on the second row of the grid with car 88 of Wing Cup and Thompson. McIntyre and Thompson will start. Dean Canto will start this race for car 55. And Mark Scaife, five-time Australian touring car champion, We'll have the job first up for car 888. There's David Reynolds and Tim Blanchard and Greg Murphy and Alan Simonson. Both co-drivers starting there. Same two for car 5 and car 1. So Stephen Richards and Cam McConville. Non-regular drivers but certainly well-known names. Todd Kelly and David Russell. Rick and Owen Kelly. No relation but David and Owen will start. Michael Caruso. Car 34 will be the first of the regular drivers to start. We now have confirmation that four regular drivers will start. I'll get to the others when we get there. But Count Paul Morris and Greg Ritter in for starting duties from positions 15 and 16. Nathan Pretty and young Jack Perkins will get things underway the row behind. There's Dale Wood and Taz Douglas for car number three. James Moffat and Matt Halliday, the US-based Kiwi, to get things moving. Tim Slade should be behind the wheel for car 47. So there's our other regular driver starting, Andy Jones. Will pilot car eight first up, Dean Fiore and Michael Patrizzi. Michael doing Porsche duties as well. He had a good race earlier on in the Porsche. Carl Reindler and David Wall from positions 25 and Stevie Johnson, Dave Bernard will start. And then at the back row of the grid, Jason Barguana will start car 14. Alex Davison will start car number four. And they have had a shocker of a weekend. Poor old Alex and David. Their take on it was terrible. Big changes overnight. Don't even bother asking what they are because they're going to be everything. And hopefully we can find some speed. I love this shot. And for a couple of reasons, it just lines up these 28 roaring V8s at us, but also also shows the elevation and the fall away in the road down the main straight to turn one. Normally about now I bring us up to speed with anything that's come from the stewards and various infringements. It's been a pretty quiet weekend in this regard. 
However, there's been a couple of odd ones last night. Nemo Racing, which is Paul Morris Motorsport, and also Triple Eight Team Vodafone. Their crews have been fined for driving against the red light in the tunnel here to leave the track. Don't forget, if you're out and about, you can catch all the V8 supercar action on your Telstra Next G Mobile. With thanks to Big Pond Sport, we've got all the coverage there. Find in the tunnel. Yeah, I'll just expand on that. The boys all get in the crew bus <laughs> and they all file off at various intervals during the night. Often the work runs very late here and there's a light, a traffic light system in the tunnel yeah. which flows one way or the other here. So <laughs> they've uh, chosen to run the gauntlet and go against the light. They've been sprung. They've both been fined $2,000. 1,000 of which is suspended to the end of the year. So Lucky that's the a, cops didn't get them. That's about the uh, the biggest issue we've had in the judiciary for the last couple of days. But uh, how's this? Isn't that gorgeous? That's uh, looking over towards the east, down towards San Remo, the other end of the island, and uh, the turns there. Well, there's turn three, four is the hairpin, and then across to Siberia. Here we go on board with Cam McConville. He's sharing James Courtney's number one car, the reigning champion. A very tough year for James. Well, he said it's, you know, the, the championship's gone. He understands that now, but what can turn a bad year into a good year for James Courtney would be endurance success. Here's Jack Perkins. We got to know Jack well a couple of years ago when he had a full-time stint. He then had to uh, leave full-time V8 driving as diabetes came on his radar. But it's great to see Jack in. This man's often referred to as Australia's fastest plasterer, Greg Ritter. Uh, he's a full-time plasterer and now he mixes it up with uh, endurance duties isn't that a great scene will davison on the left in monitoring g'day will mark winterbottom his teammate paul dumbrell so they've entrusted their cars to their teammate australia's fastest commentator mate <laughs> yeah right at the moment you won't get much commentary chat out of it he'll have his race face on and i know it well yeah it's not to be meddled with he's, he's brushed us completely matt halliday here i spoke to him just before everybody went out onto the grid he's living in Los Angeles, he's doing a bit of Porsche racing in the US and of course in the Northern Hemisphere in sedan based racing, things have been a bit quiet but he's had a busy year and he's looking to have a busier one next year. Here's a guy who's trying to make an impression today, he's typically had a good run in these Enduros, I think it was 7th here last year for Dean Canto and uh, he's driving the Botlow car normally driven by Paul Dumbrell who will retire at the end of the year. Andrew Thompson spoke to him on the grid pressure on his shoulders today but he described it in that interview out on the grid before no big deal i'll just go and do what i always do he's got a handy little lead in the fujitsu series at the moment he's got 1055 points after four rounds with three rounds remaining on board here with luke yulden there's chris o'toole just moving off the wall team manager that's that front row that i spoke about interesting isn't it that out of that front row if you put your regular drivers in there you'd have will davison and garth tander a couple of years ago, they won this race together for the Toll Holden Racing Team. Now, Matt, you know this because you've been standing here with me when this has been going on. Our commentary box is probably only 50 metres from the front row of the grid. Everybody rehearses their starts. The cars will have 120 litres of sucrogen bioethanol in the back of them. They've also got what we describe as a 325 diff, which is very tall gearing. I reckon we've seen two-thirds of the field here in the last couple of days practising their starts and 90% of the field are making shocking starts. So let's see what happens now when it really matters. Got a car with a problem, the yellow flags on the right side are being displayed. A car is stalled. Who is it? What is it? Is it Thompson? I can't work it out. It's an aborted start. It's an aborted start. There is a problem. Confusion reigns supreme at the moment. So an aborted start. The revs were up. They were ready to go. Flags out. Have you moved, mate? Have you moved? Damien, what have we got here? A start delayed. Start delayed, Tim. Uh, car stalled at the front of the grid. OK. So car has stalled at the front of the grid. It appears to be Nick Perkat, car two. So a delayed start. And I tell you what, they only just got it in time too, because that could have been all sorts of mayhem. So it's jammed in gear. Uh, they may be able to start it, bump start it, but that means they'll have to bring it into the pit lanes. It's got to be able to start. Got to be able to start on its own starter. 
We're getting messages that uh, suggest that unable to start, but we heard Nick on the radio yeah. there a moment ago. He wants him to rock uh, the car. Reconfirming the start will now uh, uh, go down into the five-minute signal. So let's just play a five-minute signal and we'll do, uh, resume its uh, count, start countdown. Just stand by. I'll give you the mark for the five-minute signal. That's race director Tim Schenken. Uh, rule here, so uh, we'll come out and do something. Alistair we'll McVeigh. Keep in touch. Engineer for the car, Frank Adamson from V8 Supercar there with the official written across his back. Shane Howard there, who's currently the acting chief executive officer for V8 Supercars Australia. So a bit of pressure on down there at the moment, but a good call to abort because with a car at the very front of the grid, what would happen if you're back in the mid or very back of the grid, you'll be doing well in excess of 130, 40 kilometres an hour as you pass that start reference line and uh, you could have a shocking incident there so we saw the flags I couldn't work out whether or not it was the first or the second row and uh, so we're in start delay and we'll hear Tim in the background of the race management channel shortly to recommence the procedure so these are the boys from the Toll Holden racing team that's a jump battery that they're bringing down it's called an Anderson clip uh, on the end of that that they'll plug into the that coupling will go into the rear of the car like a jump battery to get it started. But the car has to be able to be demonstrated to be started off its own power if there's a drama. And what he'll do with that hammer is he'll whack the starter motor, which is there <laughs> hanging down low. We've all done it. Low tech. Everybody's done it. So a delayed start here at the LNH 500. Thank you. 
At any V8 supercar event, you have to expect the unexpected, especially at an endurance event, and that's what's happened right here. Nick Perkat, car number two, position number two on the grid, has in the ad break done this, demonstrated that the car can first of all start, but the officials wanted to make sure that it could start under its own accord. Yeah, the rules dictate, and that's Frank Adamson on the left of the rear of the car, that you've got to be able to demonstrate that it can start itself. So they gave it a couple of revs just to make sure that the alternator was charging. They switched it off, they yeah. fired it back up, and uh, the reality is that he will have to come back after this formation lap now and either start from pit lane or pit exit. Now, but what I would do is I'd come into the lane, stick some fuel in it, and trundle down the end and start from the end of pit lane. Larko, your thoughts? Well, I've got GT down here with me, Garth. Bit unlucky, but not all bad. That was a very good call of yours, I reckon. Bring him in and put fuel in. All is not lost. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, whether we've got to start from pit lane or what. So if we've got to start from pit lane, we might as well come here and put another two laps of fuel back in it that opens up our window at the back end, because obviously that's going to change our strategy. So. Um, Disappointing if we have to start from pit lane, which I think is what's going on by lots of things. So, um, you know, Nick's done a fantastic job all day Saturday and he'll drive us through the field, no problems. You can get creative with that strategy, mate. Good luck. Well, like how you can let Garth know that they will start from pit lane. They made that clear. It was either rear of the grid or pit lane. So pit lane it will be for car number two of Nick Perkhout and Garth Tander, which will leave an empty spot on the front row of the grid alongside Luke Yildon. What a turn of events. At the last minute, the revs were building. We were just about to get going. And out came the flags to abort that start. This will um, show how much of a cool head Nick Perkat's got. 23 years of age, he managed to handle that situation. You'd have to say, OK. The team swung into action quickly. Race control got onto it. And now, Nick has to reset. I mean, 10 minutes ago, he was looking at starting the first endurance event of the season from the front row. Now he's going to have to adjust to the thought process of starting from pit lane after 27 cars have gone ahead of him. An entirely different job, an entirely different strategy. The game changes, thinking on the run. So what we thought we might do while the boys are on this formation lap once again is uh, take you back to the moment where the command was given for Nick Perkat to start from pit lane or the end of pit lane. Okay. Yeah, so that's Alistair McVane. And he's just instructed uh, there with the Frank Adamson in the background saying, what I want you to do is come into the pit lane and then we'll reel, wheel you down the end and uh, start from the pit lane exit. So the choice was there, either go to the back of the grid or start from the lane. They'll take the lane. I'd be incredibly surprised if they didn't come in and squirt some fuel into it because they've now effectively done, even though they're slow, Matty, this is like doing three laps, so uh, I haven't really got a calculation on that, but I'm guesstimating it'd be around about five or six litres of fuel thereabouts. Whatever it is, you might get another lap or two out of the car now, extend the window, so it'll change his sequence. The other problem that he's got, of course, is he's got to be very careful when he goes back out there, he doesn't find himself tangled up in all the nonsense that happens at the back end of the field. Now, I've had a couple of people ask me why the lights are flashing on various cars. Uh, the lights are flashing because when the pit lane speed limiter is engaged, there, there's a light in the boot of the car, which you'll see in a moment as he drives away, the red light flashing, and uh, it's timed the same. Get off there at the moment. But um, it's so that they can distinguish one car from the other within teams. Clearly, when they're painted the same, it's very difficult sometimes to work out which of your cars is in the lane. So many of the two-car teams that are painted the same are choosing to tie their headlights to their pit lane speed limit a lot. We don't have to worry about it for quite a few laps yet, but pit lane will be the scene of some chaos later on. Driver changes, everything that goes with an endurance race. This is quite a narrow pit lane. It's not easy to stack your cars if you want to come in one after the other in terms of teams. So Nick Perkett, ready to start the LNH 500 from pit lane. He's at the exit on the front row of the grid. Ford Performance Racing chasing their first win of the season. Luke Yildon has nobody in front of him, but here comes Andrew Thompson in car 88. From position four, Andrew Thompson took a good look at it. And already Shane Van Gisbergen's partner, John McIntyre, has come up to second place. 
So Thompson had a good look at it, but just couldn't get the power down. He finds Mark Scaife on his outside at the southern loop. Dean Canto tucks into third position. Around turn two they go. I don't know which car it was, obviously, with all the noise. Scaife will be better positioned here when they get down to the right-hander at turn four. But somebody had an enormous amount of clutch slippage going on. So the Vodafone cars side by side. Canto's up to third. Scaife still on the inside there. Tim Blanchard drops in next behind Scaife. So Yulden, McIntyre, Canto. One, two, three. And there was contact then between Thompson and Scaife because Thompson on the radio say it's got a whack from Scaife. Around the hay shed, extraordinarily high speed corner. Up to Lukey Heights, now back down again. Turn 10, Thompson has got around Scaife, has a look on the inside of Canto. So the team Vodafone cars in the thick of it on lap one, but Luke Yildon will bring him around. Turn 12 on the Gardner Straight. McIntyre behind him. There's Canto, the bottle O entry. He's got Thompson on his hammer. Then Mark Scaife, Tim Blanchard, Stratco racer. Behind them, Stephen Richards, Owen Kelly, and Alan Simonson make up the 10 from the start. That's an awkward place for Andrew Thompson to be looking down the inside at one. You very rarely see a pass made there, and it tightens up the line. It makes the radius of the corner more difficult to negotiate. He's very, very close to the back of Canto, who's just treading gently on cold tyres and full fuel. He might have a look at him down the inside here at turn four. And does. Oh, big lock up there from Blanchard and he manages to stop it, so that pass now made by Thompson. So what I predicted worked out then for Andrew Thompson. Scapes up on the outside in Siberia. That's awkward if you try and crisscross him. What Mark will be trying to do here is think about what happens at MG. So down at turn 10, the bottom of the hill, will be what his focus is, or he'll also be thinking about turn four on the next lap, if indeed Kanto's a little vulnerable. Car off, 33, Ritter. Oof and he's had to drive over the kerb there to get it back on. So probably contact, I'd suggest, down at Siberia. How's the move from Scaife on Canto that time? That was at the top of Lukey Heights on the inside of the exit of Turn 9. So he's dived in on the left-hand side instead of waiting for the right-hander at MG at the bottom of Turn 10. Yulden brings him around. His advantage is half a second. We'll see what it is now as he crosses the control line onto this replay. Back at uh, the Honda hairpin between the teammates. Oh. Uh, that's the reason why there was contact. That was back at the start of the race, and then Andrew reported the contact. Here it is again from the other angle. And it was because of the nose to tail contact between Scape and Canto, and then he basically ricocheted off to the side. Here's what happened down at turn five, and that was car number three, which was Taz Douglas at the wheel making contact there with Greg Ritter at turn five. Lowndes watching and waiting <laughs> so 0.7 of a second is Luke Gilden the first flying lap is 135.98 on the inside again at turn four Stephen Richards having a look at David Russell in the Jack Daniels car and there's Owen Kelly car 15 alongside the sister car Amazing how they group up, isn't it? This time Owen fires through. At the hay shed. Todd, Rick, look on. There's the other car out of that Kelly Brothers clan. Car 11, the Pepsi Max crew. Down at turn 10 is Tim Blanchard. Lucky to get away with that without rubbing some paint against Dean Cando. So Cando is, is a marked man in these first couple of laps. He's done enough V8 supercar racing to know that it'll settle down sooner or later. Boy, he's under fire. Andrew Thompson, by the way, is on a flyer. He's just done the fastest lap of the race, a 135.7. They've already told John McIntyre to lean off the fuel a little bit, but he, because these guys that are essentially visitors in the car, he didn't quite click it right, so he went back to position three. They've asked him to go back to position two. 
Imagine what it's like trying to drive one of these cars around here at an average speed of 175 kilometres an hour and tweaking little knobs and buttons on the steering wheel. So already teams are starting to think about how to manage the fuel consumption in this event. Scaife, 36.5 best lap. Thompson, 35.7 as you just pointed out, Matty. 36.1 for McIntyre, 35.9. They're the best laps for the top four cars. And so we're still waiting for them all just to settle in here. They've got a lot of fuel on, trying to figure out what sort of balance they've got. And one of the things that seems to be telling with the tyre around here at the moment, if you abuse it too hard too early, you really pay the price in the mid to late stint. So a lot of drivers not too willing to hurt the tyre very early in the race because they'll have to then pay a price that goes for a good hour or so. Thompson had a think about looking at Johnny McIntyre at turn 10. It's a little short shift from second to third, climbing back up out of turn 10. This is the left-hander 11, the final corner here, fourth gear. We saw a huge slide in one of the qualifying sessions yesterday from McIntyre. Sixth gear just before you get to that Armour All Bridge. A bit of a headwind today, so they won't be quite at the same peak speed value. And this is the battle between McIntyre and Thompson. McIntyre's had great success in New Zealand touring car racing. And Thompson's rediscovering his V8 supercar career now with support from Team Vodafone, Triple Eight Race Engineering. Stephen Richards was tap, tap, tapping away at the ba back of the Stratco car and he's finally got past. So car five goes up to position six. There's Yulden. 1.3 second lead. He's got over John McIntyre. Andrew Thompson third. Dean Canto is fourth. There's Richards. Then it's tight, all the way down. Incidentally, uh, Greg Ritter, after that little excursion down at turn six, is 30, uh, sorry, 24 seconds off the lead of the race. Nick Perkat, who's second last at the moment, he's 16 seconds away. So numerically, it looks crook to say you're 27th, but 16 seconds, a safety car will get all that back. Luke Yulden is our race leader, just over one second the gap.
Live V8 Supercar Racing on seven, John McIntyre and Mark Scaife. Positions three and four. About half a lap ago, Scaife got by McIntyre and about a metre later, McIntyre got the position back. So Scaife will have to do it all again. Luke Yildon is our race leader by almost two seconds now. Starting from pole position, Andrew Thompson is second. And this battle here, the SP Tools Falcon against the Team Vodafone Commodore. Behind them, Stephen Richards. This is uh, last lap and uh, Thompson down the inside and McIntyre made space. It's a great battle between these guys. John Mack's car just looks a little bit slippery in the rear at the moment. Here is again from on board. This is the perspective we see from Andrew Thompson's car. And he got it pulled up, turned and got away with it out the other side. No paint exchange, job done. Greg Murphy's car, Alan Simonson. So that's car 11 finding the uh, exit route at turn four. So uh, that's a front left that looked like it was uh, pretty heavily locked there as Alan went off down the escape road at turn four. This little battle here, Matt Halliday, car number 18, and uh, he's engrossed in this battle here with Nick Percat. So Nick making his way up through the field as we suggested. He's losing to the leader though, he's 20 seconds away from the leader. If you remember my comment a few laps ago, I said he was 16 seconds away. So he's making positions, but he's losing ground to the leader. It's an important thing to keep in the back of your mind in the overall picture of things. But he hasn't put a foot wrong so far this weekend. It's been a good display. Started from pit lane, Nick Perkat after staring down a front row start. Car wouldn't get going. And now he's got the job to push on as hard as he can before he hands back over to Garth Tander, but that's a fair way down the track. John McIntyre just reporting a moment ago that it's got high speed oversteer. We saw that. That means the back of the car is sliding around a lot and Mark Scaife will be getting a bird's eye view of it at the moment. He's making some anti-roll bar adjustments to try and trim the car and settle it down. It does look like it's calmed down. It's getting better to the tune of about two and a half kilos a lap of fuel load, which will be helping as well. These guys are engrossed in a good battle. Scaife did actually get by before, but he overshot and then uh, lost ground. And here's the man that'll have to step into that SP Tools entry later in the day. This battle's pretty willing and it's certainly not done with yet. But one of the good movers in the opening, what, almost 10 laps of this race has been Stephen Richards for Ford Performance Racing, started ninth. And he's gone up to fifth. And He's in the position behind these guys where he can just concentrate on quick lap times. He's not dicing with anybody at the moment, as opposed to this dice. Richo's got great endurance experience. He knows how to play it. Now, we've had reports from various quarters around the circuit that car 88 is under investigation for a jump start at the moment. That is Andrew Thompson. Oof. And, it, well, relative to those around him, he certainly bolted. But, of course, the bigger part of the story is what did that look like compared to the lights? It's the lights that are the bit that matters, but look around. And certainly his reaction has been better than those car around him, but that doesn't necessarily make him guilty. You've got to be able to see the light to be able to make that judgment call. That's being investigated at the moment by race control. I mean, if it is a, if it is a clean start, it was a ripper start. Adrian Burgess. Deep in thought and discussion. Jamie Winkup looking on behind him. The other one who got a great start was John McIntyre. I mean, I thought for all money that Thompson would just charge straight ahead and pull up alongside this man, but McIntyre shot across and closed the door. Great job from Luke Yildon. He's involved in a, a stunt driving business with Dean Canto, funnily enough, and poor old Dean was, <laughs> he was under attack. He needed some stunt driving earlier. He's currently in seventh, Dean, after starting from fifth and getting up towards the top three in the opening laps. Luke's a, an interesting story because a lot of the regular, non-regular drivers in this field have one drive or another somewhere in some category in some part of the world and Luke really has just had to rely on test days and his experience. Of which there's six in total across the year but many teams have still got some up their sleeve. There have also been sessions in events leading up to this. Winton, Darwin, Townsville, Queensland Raceway where co-drivers have been given valuable kilometres in the lead up. So there's a more concerted effort now than there's ever been in the past to make sure that those that jump in at these races are better prepared. On board here with Cam McConville down inside the hollow at turn 10. 
can at the moment, position nine. That's Owen Kelly's rear bumper that he's looking at. And uh, just behind him, he's got the other Jack Daniels car being driven at the moment by David Russell. So things are settling down. What's interesting is that the gaps are stretching. Isn't that a wonderful shot through the final corner? But not only are they stretching, Matt, but the speed isn't there. Mark Scaife confidently said to me after the warm-up this morning that he expected that they'd be racing in mid to high-ish 36s. Well, the last lap for Yulton was a 37.6, Thompson 37 even, McIntyre 7.5, Scaife 7.4. So they're as much as three quarters of a second to a second away from what Mark was talking about earlier in the day. Check out the footwork here of Cameron McConville. Our camera deep in the well of car number one. Coming around turn three, up to four. That little brake pedal confidence tap that you saw Cam do is a, a result of a thing that we call knockoff. There's big sawtooth curbs around this track. And when the car drives over them, just imagine rattling the fillings out of your head, folks. That's the feeling in the car. It's just this massive vibration goes through the car. And for the brake pads inside the brake caliper, they're hydraulically operated, they rattle back away from the brake disc. So if the driver doesn't bring those brake pads up to the disc face, when you go for the brake pedal, you don't get anything like enough front brake and you get way too much rear brake because they're sitting there ready to do the job all primed up to go. So you arrive at the corner, we affectionately describe it as two turning and two burning. So you slide into the corner out of control with white knuckle fever. So it's a trick that you've got to learn around here. It's in your repertoire on the right of turn four. Bring the brakes up. Yildon's lead has been cut by about two tenths of a second over the last lap or two. In fact, another two tenths. So Andrew Thompson is closing in on our race leader.
back just in time to see the first change for the lead of the race. Luke Yulden finally rounded up on lap 14 out of 113. And Andrew Thompson has gone by. So Team Vodafone takes the lead of the LNH 500. He was, I mean, he was just waiting and waiting and waiting and executed it perfectly here. Beautiful job, turn, turn three. He uh, got him sized up and then straight down the inside at the right-hander, second gear right-hander. And in fact, Lukey knew that he was coming and he gave him tons of space here. He's been stalking for the last couple of laps. Want to clear up also, we raised the question, what was the start all about there for Andrew Thompson? It's been looked at, it's been referenced against the lights and what it was was a great reaction time. Basically everybody else was asleep. In the old days we've seen drivers get pinged just because they react well. So uh, good call from race control to analyse that one carefully. So Andrew Thompson, no problem, no penalty, leads the race. Already Bill three quarters of a second now over Luke Yildon. So he's got pace on his side. Update on uh, Nick Perkett. He's still in position 17 and is doing a great job. And inside the top 10, which has been a staggering march up through the field, has been Jason Bargwana, and we'll get to him at some point for you and just show you him. Car number 14, John Neil, Libby Commodore. The, sorry, mate, one of the issues Luke Yildon's got out there in the car at the moment, no communication. They can actually hear him, the guys here at FBR, he can't hear them, and that's very, very difficult as a driver. They've got the board out there, they're trying to flash headlights, but let's just see if we can grab Will Davo, Frosty, um, from the driving seat. Um, we know they can't talk to, to Luke. Very, very difficult trying to drive a race car when you can't hear your team corresponding to. Yeah, it's a bit concerning at this stage of the race. I mean, uh, obviously strategy's wide open at the moment and uh, we need to be giving Luke information even to assess the balance and tell him to, you know, change fuel mixtures, change the roll bars. So we're trying to figure out a way to uh, fix the drama and hopefully when I get in, it's, it's a problem on his end, not the cars. Good one. And Frosty, I'm guessing when you used to drive for me, mate, there's probably times you wish your earpieces didn't work, eh? <laughs> I had selective earpieces back then. They work sometimes. But um, no, don't see yourself short. You were pretty good on the grid, motivational. Just leave it at that. Thanks, buddy. Good on you. Hey, we've, all, Larko, we've all got those selective earpieces when Larko's there. Larko, while you're wandering around, what you should do is go and grab some earpieces because that's the problem. When you can hear the driver, it means that he's plugged into the B pillar and the microphone's working. When it's not a case of him being able to receive them, it's because that little tag has fallen out on his helmet. Maybe show us at some stage. So here's the man you were talking about, Jana Living Racing. Jason Bargwana started from position 27. He's now up to ninth. Already David Bernard, by the way, has been through pit lane and Mark Scaife has now entered pit lane on lap 16. So he's completed 15. And Scaife will arrive shortly at the Team Vodafone pit. What a job from Jason Bargwana. And uh, Percat's in as well. So uh, this is very similar to what happened last year with this car. And there'll be a, another set of tyres. Back to Tolar HRT at the other end of the lane. The fuel to go. Get ready. As soon as we drop you, you're good to go. First gear. Away you go. Away you go. Clear. 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 And I don't know whether they made any little chassis adjustment to Mark's car. But fresh tyres, full fuel, and importantly, clear track. Now, last year, this clear track phase of the race gave him a really solid giddy-up in terms of what con what contributed to an overall result. So he was out there, the car uh, behaved nicely, had good speed. Nick Perkat's going to be able to do the same. They basically run their own race for a long time now. It's like your own private test session. So uh, we'll, even though they drop down the order, we need to pay very careful attention to them later in the day as they phase in. And it is a good strategy, Neil. Work well for them. Um, I talked to teams earlier and I'm a little bit surprised. There was a lot that we're talking about coming in earlier, but I reckon that's caught them out. We talked about the heat of the day and it is quite hot on the track surface now and they're really concerned about this tyre degradation. So their, their thinking has changed a little bit because if you go and pit early now, you're going to ask your tyres to do more work at the other end of the day. So they're choosing to stay out a little longer and share that tyre load a little more. Yeah, I think we're hearing more people on the radio reacting now, though, like I said, clearly for Team Vodafone and Toll HRT, they flinched first, but I think there'll be more join them shortly. Everybody's got their own view on this, but given that you can get roughly 36 laps from here, 
that'll take them out to, a f if they go all the way to the end of the fuel, which some may choose not to, that'll get them to about lap 52. And we'll talk more about that shortly. So this is Andrew Jones, Team BOC here. They're waiting for fuel. He was on the podium last year with Jason Richards, paired up this time around with Jason Bright. So they're doing the same as HRT and Vodafone. They're resetting the fuel so that uh, back in the data bunker and on the steering wheel, everybody knows what your fuel consumption figure looks like, which at the moment be roughly 2.5 to 2.6 kilos of fuel a lap. That equates to about roughly three and a quarter litres. So it's a big Coke bottle in a bit. So we're going to stay on board here with the chopper looking down at this beautiful racetrack from above. It's David Wall in front of Richard Lyons and car 47 of Daniel Gaunt. Positions 19, 20 and 21. Richard Lyons, the only Philip Island debutant this weekend, although he's a very experienced worldwide racer, an Irishman in the Mother Energy car. Daniel Gaunt, a successful weekend already in the Porsche Carrera Cup. And Lyons comes in. That's the entry to pit lane, so Gaunt fires around turn 11 and 12, bring you on to Gardner Straight. We're going to have to hold there for Tim Blanchard. That's doing corner. Oh, oh, oh. Gaunt got it a bit wide at turn one. Down to the southern loop. Jack Perkins in for super cheap auto. So the exit of turn two. Down here is where we've got one of our curb cams. Three. Up to Honda Hairpin. Where Andrew Thompson took the lead off Luke Yulden. Wraps back around to the left-hander that is Siberia. And from the chopper, you'll see why it's named like that. If you think about going off, where you'd end up. Next door to nowhere. Great lap, courtesy of our coach hire chopper. So back through the field we go and we find uh, the Kelly Brothers racing entry of David Russell with Jack Perkins behind him. Both of those guys have stopped, so we've also got Luke Yielden coming in. Lights flashing for Ford Performance Racing. Pit lane speed limiter on. It's been a great opening stint for him. So these guys that we're seeing peeling in now, including Scaife and Percat, these guys... They'll do one more fuel load. Yeah, oh, yeah. I can see what he's working on. It's the earpieces on the right of the helmet. It's not plugged in properly. He did get contact because he definitely said, "Yeah, I can hear you." Check, mate. Radio check. Oh, it's fickle, isn't it? Yeah, it's a drama for them. It just makes it awkward. It, un it unnerves everybody. It unsettles everybody. You can still do it from the pit board. And that was done that way for many years. There goes Scaife down the inside. So that's actually important. That's very important. So uh, that's that's a genuine position for Mark Scaife. Um, you look at, say, Scaife's numbers where they came in on lap 16, Matty. Uh, the point that I was going to make is that you could do... You don't have to go to the bottom of your tank. You could do 32 laps from, from here, from that point bring him in, put Lowndes in the car, and then do a series of 32 lap sequences. It gets you up to about lap 112, 113, which I think is what people are going to do. They'll take the most even strategy for their tyre wear from that first stop in the race, and they won't necessarily take all the fuel out of the tank. It also means it takes less time to bring it back up. In total, and these are all based on averages, you're going to need 374 odd litres of the sucrage and bioethanol to get the job done. So you can play with it a little bit. You can try and undercut people, bring them in earlier and get around traffic that you're racing with. But in the end, you've got to deliver that amount of fuel. So Andrew Thompson is the race leader. 11 cars have so far gone through pit lane. At the front of that queue of those two have completed a pit lane stop is Mark Scaife in car 888. Daniel Gaunt has just gone in as well. 
driver of the race so far, you'd have to say, belongs to that man, Jason Barguana. Started from the rear of the grid, is up to fourth already at the LH 500. More than 90 laps to go in the LNH 500. We can show you what happened just while we're in the break. Andrew Thompson went through pit lane, but Mark Scaife will emerge in front of him, carrying the pace down the main straightaway. So effectively, Mark Scaife is the leader of this race. Of those who've completed a stop, Scaife's at the front of the queue ahead of Andrew Thompson. But Jason Barguana leads the race, yet to pit. Stephen Richards is second. Craig Baird is third on the road. Michael Caruso is fourth, and Paul Morris. And Warren the reason... Laugh and, uh, Warren Luff and Alex Davison take us down to seventh. The reason for that uh, is that you've offset both the Team Vodafone cars on different strategies quite clearly. Percat incidentally up to 14th. And um, you've got Mark having come in on lap 16, and you've had... Uh, Thompson having come in on lap 21. So in terms of the different fuel loads between the two cars to return them to full, it's about 16 litres of fuel at a refuelling rate of about 3.3 litres a second. Here's Barguana now. It's about five seconds different in the fuelling. That'll get checked later in the day. But uh, that explains the reason. So because Mark came in earlier, he doesn't have to spend as long okay, Dodd, bringing the fuel back up to full. Dodd, that's uh Wait. Go, 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 go. Okay. 
So great job from Jason Bargwiner from the rear of the grid to take it up. Yeah, and that was Chris Clark on the radio, the team manager in there at Team BOC. And we're just frantically cranking numbers through here at the moment, just looking at it all. Because the race pace is down, so is the fuel consumption and so is the tyre degradation. We're not seeing the same level of tyre degradation that we saw yesterday. But, I mean, it's a different game. The mentality's changed. They've moved their focus from trying to do a bonsai four and a half kilometre lap versus doing 500 kilometres. So I'm sure people are more conscious of their rear tyre and its life and behaviour at the moment as well. So bottom line is that uh, we're seeing some cars sort of averaging about 0.1 thereabouts. It's sort of lots of numbers that I've seen. And this signifies the first driver change. Shane Price jumps in the car as Bargwana leaves. We take a look at Cam McConville, car number one, alongside John McIntyre here. It's got a fair old signature in the door of the number one car in the driver's door there. Big whack. Yeah, happened. And uh, really Shane early. Price has got the all-white helmet. That's how we know that it's not Bargs in the car, and that'll also pop up electronically. So uh, Warren Luff, Gulf Western Oils. <laughs> Just having a little game of tap. So Stephen Richards comes in. Craig Baird has followed him into pit lane. Been a good job too from Richo. This guy started just inside the top 10 at night. Let's see where he pops out. There's not much in it, so Richards heads back out and he's going to head straight into traffic coming down the main straight. There's a whole stack of cars on their way. Go, 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 go. The tools entry is processed. going to say about Warren Luff a moment ago, but things got busy, so I just held back. But uh, Warren's seventh in the race yesterday is one of the best results, in fact, the best result that the Gulf Western Oils team's had so far in its young life. And uh, even though he's yet to take this initial stop, oh, that was always going to be a big whack. On Stephen Richards, it's punted number five off. Andrew Jones, you were looking out the rear of this car. And a turn four. That was a big hit. Anyway, it's just uh, OK. We can see the damage in the rear. It's a fair whack. Watch this. So he locks it up, locks it up. Couldn't control it. And I think he'll get a penalty for that, Andrew Jones. 13th at the moment. I mean, he had the left front locked and then he realised he was struggling to stop so then he's hooked it in to turn it and then it locked the right front, which of course means it won't steer. It actually lifted the back of the Orcon Ford off the road. Um, you don't need to say any words, do you, Frosty? So, uh, pretty frustrating but they're the sort of things that happen and it's guys finding their rhythm, dealing with full fuel loads and getting back into the race game. And this is what we talked about at the top of the shows in the last couple of days, Matty. This whole business of the risk management. Double the drivers, in some cases low kilometres, and some of it, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's all very well to talk about managing it, but I don't know if you're in Stephen Richards' shoes there. There's not very much you can do about it. I mean, it's just one of those things, these missiles occasionally come at you in this business. And at the wrong time, and it's always the wrong time, but it, especially after you've just completed your pit stop, you're now getting yourself reset, head back out there. He'd only just left pit lane and got to turn four when that occurred. Meanwhile, at the other side of the FPR garage, Luke Yulden continues to punch away some very good laps here. Started from pole position. He's conceded a couple of spots on the road with two drivers still to pit, being Michael Caruso and Warren Luff. When that happens, Mark Scaife will take the lead of the race. Andrew Thompson will be second, and this man will be third, Yulden. Luke Yulden, you're right uh, there, Matty White still hasn't got communication. So if I just show you how this works, Neil, you were saying before, there's little ear moulds, they're, they're foam ones. Some of the guys have those moulded into the shape of their ear. 
when the driver pulls his helmet on, he then plugs that into here, okay? That communication then plugs into another lead in the car when the driver gets in the car, so that's not working. And by the way, that little device here, in case you're wondering, hands device, that's held down by the seat belts, and as you can see, that tethers the helmet, and it's a great safety innovation in a frontal impact. But at the moment, there's your drone. And I don't know if you saw them in the pit stop. They actually put a piece of pen and paper in front of him. Another great innovation, eh? <laughs> bit of old-fashioned, bit of yeah. smoke signal stuff, Larko, like you and I dealt with. Take your whiteboard down there, Larko. Yeah. See if you can squeeze that in the cockpit. So it's either been a failure of the ear pieces, and that's unusual. It's usually the connector isn't seated in the little connector on the side of the helmet. You've got to tape them in, and sometimes there's like a final little click that they do for them to be seated in the right position. And if it sits out, then they can hear you because the microphone's in the front of your helmet and you're coupled up to the car, but you can't hear that. I reckon it's definitely a connector on it. No sparky, but <laughs> they definitely got they got contact with him and then lost it again. Yeah, a bit frustrating. And these are uh, all the sorts of things that need to be looked at in careful analysis in preparation for the Super Cheap Auto Buffers 1000 as well. Uh, you know, it's a crazy business. You spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in search of a performance tenth, plus a little bit of horsepower, a bit of a tweak on a shock absorber, whatever. But if you can't communicate, if you run out of fuel, if you get involved in accidents, all really basic things in motor racing, they have big impacts on your result. Made the point earlier that pit lane here is quite narrow. It's always going to be a bit of a drama. I also made the point that Dean Canto has a bit of a stake in a stunt driving business. This is on board the Bottolo entry. One, two... Three, goes through about what, four pit bays to get back out onto the fast lane because there's traffic in there. He needed to. He had to get back because there's actually a cone marker exactly. at the end of the lane and you've got to be to the right of it. It's been put there for exactly that reason to stop cars from just driving side by side down there forever. Stevie Johnson looking on. Didn't have a good qualifying day yesterday, which is what it was. It wasn't a session. It was a full day of qualifying. And David Bernard is uh, right there behind the wheel of car 17. Stevens had a terrific season, a really strong qualifying season in particular. He's sixth in the championship. So he's making his mark felt. He'd love nothing more than to fire a big shot at the endurance time of the year. With the exception of the Toll HRT car glitch at the start with the start related issue, all cars appear to have been pretty reliable so far. Well, on that point too, we'll zero in on Nick Perkat sooner or later and just check in because remember, he started at pit exit. He's now worked his way back up to sixth position when Caruso and Luff go into pit lane. That will be an effective fourth position. So it's been a hell of a drive from this young man. And that's where I was leading because uh, this has been a good job and uh, nice work to be able to get the car, put that extra little bit of fuel in it after the crisis at the start, and just run around in clear air, then they brought him in, and, they, and what they did is they brought him in in step with the leader, so they don't want to lose touch with what the leader's doing, and they know that that's going to be a pretty effective way of operating. Remember when he came back out onto the track, similar to, like you say, with, with Scaife had... Mark Scaife had pure track position, no uh, one around him. Bingo. So you heard Al in the answer. background. <laughs> I, yeah, I like listening. Uh, so tw 12 on these tyres, 27 in, in total. So that sort of confirms that what I've been thinking, that what people are going to do is run a whole series of these 27, 28, 29 lap stints, depending on who you are. They don't want to go all the way to the bottom of the fuel load because it kills the tyres. More in a moment.
Live V8 Supercar Racing at the LH LH 500 here at Phillip Island. And take a look at pit lane and that shot right there. This is a critical moment for the bottle O entry of Dean Canto and Paul Dumbrell. Canto has just served a drive through penalty for what we showed you a little bit earlier of going through too many pit bays to exit after his stop. So, black flag shown to car 55. He's gone straight in and completed the penalty. He was punching up inside the top five players. They qualified fifth. Canto had done a good job to keep his wits about him under maximum attack. But now they're going to have to start from way back. He's gone right to the rear of the field after going through pit lane. Meanwhile, Michael Caruso leads the race, but he's yet to pit. Same two for Warren Luff. So you're looking here at your effective race leaders of Mark Scaife in car 888 and Andrew Thompson in car 88. Larko? Well, Matty, you recognise that silhouette just about anywhere, wouldn't you? We'll go and tap it on the shoulder. Oi, young bloke. Hey, <laughs> hey uh, you must be pleased, mate. Um, we have this chat every year, you know, you put Scaifey back in the car and you think, oh, yeah, another year later, probably can't do as good a job, but gee whiz. Look, uh, firstly, I've got to make sure you've got your branding iron on you. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, this, the, um, yeah, look, yeah, we can drag him out of the commentary box, get him away from you guys for a while, get him back to a bit of sense of, sense of humour a bit. And, uh, and really, uh, he's really good. Like, he, uh, he loves this place. He also loves Bathurst. And they're the two races that we obviously want to win. OK, well, we've just saw Tomo's just got by him on the track. I guess you're not too worried. I noticed you've rolled out exactly the same strategy as last year. Worked pretty well then, eh? Yeah, well, it did, Larko, and I think that, uh, you know, really everyone's sort of now understanding, obviously, your fuel consumption. Your tyre wear is probably going to be the higher um, uh, degradation over the course of today. So the way the sun is and the way the temperature is, we saw yesterday's sprint race, the tyres drop away. Teams have made adjustments, but as you can see, you know, guys are obviously looking for shorter runs and probably more, more of them than what we did last year. I can see you're doing the scape bounce, mate, so you're keen to get in the car. Good luck. Thank you. Right. He would be bouncing too because, uh, as you mentioned, Larko, while you're talking to Craig Lowndes there, his teammate Mark Scaife got looped past by Andrew Thompson. So a switch at the effective front of this race. Something going on down at turn four at the moment. I also intercepted a message that there'll be a pit lane drive through penalty for Andrew Jones in the Team BOC car for the contact that he had with Stephen Richards. So uh, here we go on board. This is Andrew Thompson down the inside for the effective lead of the race. Mark Scaife not bothering to respond. Clearly, his uh, balance isn't quite right at the moment. He's not in a frame of mind to be bothered uh, battling. So an interesting little inter-team battle going on there. So now I also heard the sister car to this car go past me before sounding incredibly rough. Look at the big ding in the bonnet of Andrew Jones' car. So. Shane Price at the helm of the Jarn Living Commodore that Jason Barguana was driving. Maybe he couldn't get it out of fifth gear and into top gear just past our commentary point, but it was making a heck of a racket. So any tick of the clock, Andrew's going to have to tour the lane here as well. So that car 14 that you're talking about, Barguana and Price, Price behind the wheel up to 12th now. So Here's this is the incident that, that caused it. You remember a big whack in the back of Stephen Richards that sent Richo spearing off at turn four. Left a big dent in the back of car five and a big dent in the front of car eight. Next time around, the Team BOC car will be doing the, the walk of shame in pit lane. Yeah, Matty, Brad Jones just been talking to Jason Bright, but uh, Brad, not good news there for Andrew. He'll have a drive through. Yeah, I just think it's a really bad decision. You know, at the end of the day, they say in the driver's breathing, you need to stay on one line. If you just pick that line, you need to run down in that position, brake and turn the corner. Stephen came out on cold tyres. He's blocking, but no issue with that whatsoever. And he's moved back across to take his line. I really think that, um, you know, maybe the guys who make the decision weren't looking at the big pitches stuff. Maybe they didn't realise he'd been to the pits and he was on cold tyres and he was blocking. I mean, I don't know, but bad decision. And it's really had a big impact on our, on our race. We started 22nd, had a great strategy. We're up inside the top 10. And um, by doing this to us, they've basically taken us out of the race, unless there's a safety car. Right, we'll leave you to it. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Warren Luff has entered uh, pit lane, so that leaves Michael Caruso, the only man out there yet to pit, as uh, this is an unscheduled one, one enforced. So, uh, and it was interesting that just as we were about to go to that interview with Bradley, uh, Stephen Richards was clearing himself of Andrew Jones, so he'd made up that lost ground. This is Andrew Jones' voice. So oh, when we know it, you know, the driver and the, and the viewers say it's just ridiculous, but you just uh, head down and drive on, mate. 
Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, Andrew's just venting there. That's his opportunity to do so. So let him go. And then, righto, once you head off here, okay. past our commentary box just on the left, you can get got back to business. Got to be really careful that they don't go a lap down in this process. They, they've got away with it at this stage. But only just. So perilously close to going a lap down, and that's what they don't want. So Caruso yet to stop. And uh, he's just head down towards turn one, so he's only probably five, six seconds behind Andrew Jones. Of course, he'll be peeling off at some stage in the not too distant future for that first service. Alan Simonson here in the Pepsi Max crew car. With Taz Douglas behind him. The spots on car three are in reference to Tony Dalberto. Tony, I um, hope you're feeling all right, mate. Has is doing a good solid job. It's a fairly big call to be called in the morning before qualifying session of the first endurance race of the season. Now that the field's spread out a little bit, there's more fresh air between them. They've in some cases made adjustments, and in most cases now, all bar one, they've got another set of tyres on. We're seeing the pace pick up because the pace has picked up. We're watching trend lines on computer tracking and seeing that the Tire degradation is increasing again. Gregory Murphy. I'll be one to watch, as always, when we get to the mountains. It's a scary look. It's scary Murph. eyes, isn't it? Yeah. Combined 25 starts, these guys up at Bathurst. Of course, Murph's won it four times. I've mentioned you know, quite a few times this weekend, there are certain people through the field that have put all their eggs in the endurance basket. You can say that for Murphy and Simonson. They came through the field here last year to finish uh, 13th. Uh, looking there at Jack Perkins, he's 10th at the moment behind David Russell and in front of Shane Price. Jack's been blazing away in the Fujitsu series, the development series in the category this year, and he's in position four. Ooh, big nasty lockup, lock big lockup. David Russell, both fronts on the way into the right hander at 10. Jack's also been doing a bit of the quiet behind closed door ad. Uh, behind closed door work with the car of the future as well. On board we go with Jack Perkins, car 39. Here at Super Cheap Auto, we love the V8 supercars just as much as you guys. That's why we're not leaving the race, even in our own commercial break. So enjoy the race and get into Super Cheap Auto for everything auto and much, much more. It's a 22-year age difference between Jack Perkins and Russell Ingle. In fact, Jack was just 10 years old when Russell had his first race here at Phillip Island. But it's a good combination, I reckon. Ingle and Perkins again. And there's the enforcer. It's uh, been widely reported that he'll be on the move somewhere in 2012. Who knows where? Let's leave the silly season to the silly season and concentrate on the season of endurance. So you're looking at David Russell is in position nine, Jack's in 10th. Jack started from 18th and Russell started from 11th. Good effort out of Super Cheap Auto. Neil, and further to your comments, what a great little endorsement on your CV for Jack to have that testing of car of the future. I mean, it tells you for a race team, he's a great technical asset. I can assure you one thing, he didn't get those skills from his mother. <laughs> now the race leader Michael Caruso is in the pit lane so he's the last of the guys to come in and get the service affected just a couple of days old in race terms now this car first race weekend for car 34 chassis number 13 the Gary Rogers motorsport crew and a driver change Marcus Marshall leaping in and uh, Mick jumps out, so they're dropping down the order here as they bring on full load of fuel and four tyres. Andrew Thompson is now the leader of the race, one and a half seconds clear of Mark Skate. Sorry to jump in, Neil. I don't know if I don't know if you can see into the cockpit there what they've got on this new car. A fascinating little development. There's, if you look very closely, you see the little bright orange things in there next to the driver's hand. He pulls that, and he can actually move the steering wheel fore and aft, which is a great advancing as, advantage as we go into the endurance races because. Tall and short drivers are a very difficult mix in a race car, and that gives you opens up your opportunity and uh, I guess your selection of drivers. Opens up 
Max Wilson come back, Jason Barguana. Yeah. <laughs> well, Michael Caruso is not the tallest bloke uh, in the world, and Marcus Marshall's he's actually at a slightly higher altitude than the rest of us. So, uh, so no, no doubt they've had to. It's, Bit of human innovation there to try and get it all sorted. Now, stats man Aaron Noonan's just come out with a figure of 18 centimetres height difference. Only Aaron Noonan would oh, know that number. There would only be one me. person in six billion that would know that number. Then again, he's so tall, he looks down on the rest of us, so there might be a bit of an adjustment needed there. Lee Holdsworth. <laughs> Speaking of vertically challenged, no, Lee Holdsworth. Car 33 in position 17. Another question mark over his future. All will be revealed after Bathurst. He's got Paul Morris in front of him in the VIP Pet Foods car. So the field has been cleansed. The green lights there on your leaderboard indicate that the co-drivers are currently in the cockpit. So that means Andrew Thompson's leading the way. Supercar Sunday at Phillip Island. The first enduro of the season. What a drive from Nick Perkat. 23 years of age from South Australia, now lives in Melbourne. Was going to start on the front row of the grid, had dramas and had to start from pit exit. As we check out the highlights, you'll see it unfold. Look at the flags going left, right and centre as Nick realised he wasn't going anywhere. The crew were called into action. 
the second take on the mother highlights showed a great start from Andrew Thompson. In fact, the stewards would look at it to see if he jumped the gun, but he just couldn't turn it into position. Luke Yulden got a ripper start and took the advantage down to turn one. John McIntyre did a good job as well. But Andrew Thompson was clearly on his game straight away. And for car 88, Thompson, who's paired with championship leader Jamie Wincup, and his head down and was really firing. When he came out of pit lane, though, after completing his stop, the other side of the garage would take over the effective lead of the race at this stage because Mark Scaife had already gone through pit lane and come out in nice, clean air and could keep his head down. So at that stage of the race, Scaife took over. Bingo. That's what cost Andrew Jones a drive through pit lane and sent Stephen Richards spearing off at turn four. This is where Thompson got Scaife. Back at four again, a clean move. Scaife just stepped aside and let him go through. No point arguing the fact. And that's how it stands right now with 74 laps to go in the LNH 500. Andrew Thompson leads by 3.8 seconds from Scaife. Yulden is third. Nick Perkat is in fourth spot. Replay here on the entry into turn two. David Russell. Wide, wide, wide. There's gravel up ahead. And there's also a tyre bundle up ahead. If he can hold on and get onto the grass and manage to uh, find his way back towards the circuit. And uh, he's complaining of front tyre damage as well. And they're asking him whether he can hang on before they get into the, the uh, window to get the car in for the next stop. Ken McConville also too needs a special mention. Starting from position 10, he's up into the top five and tucked nicely behind the other Toll Holden Racing Team car. So at the moment, it's the two team Vodafone cars, one and two. Ford performance entry of Luke Yildon and Will Davison. The pole sitters in three. Then the two Holden Racing Team cars of Perkat and McConville. As we find Matt Halliday and Lee Holdsworth, positions 15 and 16. We're coming up to a phase in the race where the, uh, shocking phrase, but the window opens if they choose to use it to come in and start taking the opportunity to put some fuel in. Remember that the earliest in of the key runners is Mark Scape. He came in on lap 15. It's now uh, lap 41. So uh, you can start to get your thoughts adjusted to the fact that that 888 car may be in any tick of the clock. Look at this run down to one. Amazingly high speed and Holdsworth tucks it in in front of Halliday for position 15. And that's just confidence. The difference between a fellow that drives in the series all the time and one that visits. Nothing wrong with the abilities of Matt Halliday. He's an accomplished Kiwi international. But uh, Lee is in the car all the time. He knows what he can get away with. Plus he's got fresh rubber on the car as well. Don't forget for Bathurst and for the Armour All 600 at Gold Coast, Seven Mate will be simulcasting our coverage in high definition. V8 supercars crystal clear on Seven Mate for the super cheap Auto, Bath uh, Auto 1000 at Bathurst and then our following event. Can't wait to see that. Live racing on Seven and Seven Mate. You can see how much of a battle that Matt Halliday was having also back at the hairpin there at turn four. He he had to have a couple of stabs at both the steering and the throttle to get the car to do what he wanted it to do. Didn't quite turn where he wanted, and then when he picked the throttle up, it broke away in the rear, so then he corrected, reset everything, and then had another go at it. But he's still hanging in here. He's currently in position 16. Very early gear shift from second to third there as they come up out of the hill. A lot of people talking fuel conservation, just trying to give themselves the best flexibility at the end of the race. Position 10 here, Owen Kelly. Stephen Richards on the clawback. Remember, contact with Andrew Jones down at turn four about 30 minutes ago. So what is it distilling to at the moment is the question in my mind. So what have we got? It's a Team Vodafone battle versus Ford Performance Racing versus the Toll Holden Racing Team. It appears as though those three teams are on for a biggie. Let's stay on board here. Oh, let's well and truly stay on board because there's some action. Now looking at the rear, so Craig Baird wants to dive in on that. 
and does so. The big hip and shoulders. In the blink of an eye, Owen Kelly got Stephen Richards go past him and Baird as well. So it's a wild a bit of action. We just happened to be opportune there. We're in the right place at the right time. So we're looking from the rear bumper of Stephen Richards' car at Craig Baird, who's off to Singapore next weekend for his ongoing International Career Cup duties. And then uh, having just had his ears boxed slightly, Owen Kelly who deputised for, Mark, uh, for Marcus Ambrose in the States recently in Canada in the Nationwide Series and qualified the NASCAR. Drove a Grand Am car with Boris Said, so Owen's doing a lot of different mileage in a lot of different race cars, and he said he's really enjoying it. Remember that name too, Boris Said, when we get to Gold Coast. He likes to turn the motor racing world upside down. Now out the front of car number six, watch this. Turn one. Keep going that way, you'll end up on your way to Tasmania. Doing corner, that is. Now around this double apex southern loop. That's the sawtooth curbing that I made mention of before. There's another one that goes all the way around, rattles the car. There's one on the outside here as well that Richo's on top of right at the gear change. This is one of the best corners in the country right here. Turn three. With good tyre condition, comfortably flat as the tyres go away. You have a little think about it. You tell the engineers it's flat until they look at the data. Right hand at turn four, second gear, 75 kilometres an hour, the slowest speed in the middle. A lot of debris on the outside of the road here. Car 55 in the wars. Dean Canto couldn't pull it up and uh, has plummeted down the order. Remember, a pit lane drive through penalty for the pit lane infringement for Dino, and he finds himself. At last count, 25th, 25th, and that may even update from what we just saw there a moment ago. Could even be further back. And you couldn't get any further opposed in the storytelling. Dean Cando was in position to be able to hand his car over to his co-driver somewhere comfortably around the top five. Now he's right down, as you mentioned, in 25th. Nick Percat starts in pit lane and has done an enormous job to keep control of his track position. <laughs> And I know why Garth Tandler and James Courtney are laughing because just as we pulled away from that shot there, Nick got a little bit taily, a little bit sideways, but it was all good. So he's aiming towards handing, watch this, this is what they were laughing about. Oh. It was <laughs> nervous laughter. <laughs> so he's looking now at handing his car back over to Garth Tander comfortably in the top five. And same too for Cam McConville. So things are going Toll Holden Racing Team's way right now. There you go, Brett. And with Garth Sander now, GT, that is an amazing performance by Nick Perkett. Yeah, he's done an awesome job and um, you know, all weekend we're saying he's been doing a great job and the guys have done a really good job with strategy. Um, it's not going to hurt us a little bit later in the race, but at least we're back up the front and uh, we can race with these dudes. Do you feel like you can be competitive from here? Yeah, I think so. I think we'll be OK. We've got two pretty good sets of tyres to go on the car so to bring it home. And Nick's brought us back like he's just about to pass the guy to start on pole position. We start in pit lane, so... Uh, I think he's done a pretty good job. GT, how long till you get in? Uh, pretty soon, otherwise. I'm sitting, sitting here with all this gear on. I want to get in the car. <laughs> hey, Barrett, ask him how nervous he was when uh, Nick just got a little bit taily then. Uh, Matty just wants to know if you're a little bit nervous when uh, Nick just got a little bit taily. <laughs> no, nah, he drives like that all, all the time. Oh. <laughs> we go down the road to get lunch, he's like that. So, um, yeah, complete faith in what he's doing. There you go, that's an endorsement, Matty. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Just don't get lunch with Nick Perkins. No, 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 I think I'm right for lunch with Nick's driving, but it's amazing, isn't it, because Garth has really been mentoring Nick um, throughout the course of the year, and they're so similar, similar height, um, you know, both skinny, both tall, and Nick Perkett is doing a Garth Tander job, a very professional, solid job, staying clear of trouble, working his way back through the field, doing everything they ask him. That's what you expect out of Tander, so Garth's a very good teacher. Meanwhile, at Ford Performance Racing, Paul Dumbrell and Mark Winterbottom are ready to go. They're like spacemen. And uh, PD there in the green gear. Like clowns, actually. Yes. Yeah, there you go. We try to portray these guys as professionals. Do not attempt this in your own home. <laughs> The, uh, Paul Dumbrell knows that he's got a big task this afternoon because of uh, where the car is currently situated, but weird things happen in these endurance races. We've still not seen any side of the Petters safety car, and these guys remember car 17 was, the I think, the first car in way back when, early in the day. So this is the first of those that have blinked, but they will go a lap down, is the message here. 
on uh, Andrew Thompson. Remember, Andrew Thompson and Mark Scaife are five laps apart in strategy. And they've just gone lap down. That's uh, David Bernard leaping out. So the race leader just went by in the background there. Car eight is in. And this will be Jason Bright climbing in. Andrew Jones vacating. They've had a drive-through penalty as a result of what happened. They're just removing one of those clear windscreen tear-offs. Motorcycle riders will be familiar with the tear-off system. Try and keep clear vision. It's a giant version of that. We saw David Bernard jump out of the gym beam racer with his, the infill of his seat. So the important thing here, Matty, is that all the co-drivers here are now ticking the requirement to do the minimum number of 38 laps, which is mandated in the rules. We're well and truly past that. So, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't continue to run your co-driver if you chose to, but it just means that if you wanted to put your primary driver in the car now, there's nothing in terms of the rules and that element of the strategy to manage. Roland Dane, don't take a risk talking to Jeremy Moore. In the centre of our screen, Craig Lowndes in battle gear and Adrian Burgess on the right. They've got their little red room set up there in uh, the garage over to the left. So remember, there's a five lap uh, offset between these two cars, 88 and 888. They're both at slightly different fuel loads, therefore, and they're both, the, uh, both slightly different in terms of their current tyre condition. That red room's not for the drivers, by the way. It's for some fans and spectators who get a front row seat to the garages. It's a great innovation from Team Vodafone seeing a working garage at at its maximum so push hard push hard is the word for Andrew Thompson who has a four second lead now over Mark Scaife there's our championship leader waiting patiently to get in that car and cut loose and he'll know that Craig Lowndes will be jumping in the sister car Tanda ready in the lane uh, now Andrew Thompson could go out as far as about lap 55, 56.7 on this load of fuel, but they may not run him that far. It'll depend on the lap speed and what the tyres are looking like. So, Percat in. And you'd have to say, at this stage of the race so far, best on ground. Nick Percat, great job, well done. Only second ever V8 supercar start. And uh, no driver assistant for these guys. Quite a few people not using that extra person that they're permitted within the rules, the crew. Fuel's been slowed down as Craig Lowndes prepares to take over from Mark Scaife. There's a restrictor in the fuel, 3.33 litres a second is the flow rate. Now, and the reason they slow it down and restrict it is to take the pressure off the drivers for the change process so that they get in and their harness is done right over the hands device and they're safely bolted into the car. And there's no Keystone Cops in that. Normally it's about 4.1 litres a second, so it's about a litre a second slower. So, Scaife in, triple eight. Lounge will be at the ready. Scaife will be as hard in here as he can get it. Here's the control light, back to first gear, get the electronic button on, and then it's all the way down, and it's the world's slowest drive. When you've been driving around... We're going to get you out this time. You are jumping out. So, loosen those belts for me. So, all the commands... The green light means that uh, co-drivers in the car. So he's loosening the belts, neutral for the gearbox when he stops. He's now uncoupled the radio from the beat pillar up to the right of the driver. Something, isn't it? You're about to replace an eight-time race winner at this circuit with a seven-time race winner. A five-time touring car champ jumps out, a three-time champ and legend of the sport jumps in. Super quick change too. Scaife was out in a hurry and Lowndes was in in a flash. Good job too, Luke Yulden. They got their name right. So Will Davison goes in and Craig Lowndes heads out for Triple Eight. So that means that uh, Scaife uh, and Yulden did about a 27 lap stint. Out goes Will Davison. In fact, Scaife did about 27 and uh, 
uh, Luki Yield did about 29 laps on that load, so they didn't get right to the bottom of it, and that means that they reached a point where they felt they didn't want to compromise the tyres. They're in the fuel window. They've got a bit of leak, fuel leaking here, or water. It's probably water most likely, because they would have topped up the water brakes and the driver water. This is Wind Cup standing by in the pit lane, stretched and warm, ready to go. Back to back, because Thompson's coming in. Here he is. So now they're bringing the strategies together with these guys. You need to open the door from the inside. You need to open the door from the inside. All these little things. Radio out for me, mate. There it is. There's the B pillar. He plucks it off the B pillar. Keep him off this door, boys. Keep it cool. And they've got a problem with we the door. It. It's not latching from the outside. So Andrew's got to open it from the inside. Now down oh, goes the. Oh, this is a drama. Okay, we've got issues yet. Door is open. Now he's got it. Bring it this door, mate. Using a driver yeah, assistant. So there's the radio coupled, the driver cool suit now coupled. Once they make sure the belts are over the hands device, up goes the window net too. And now in goes James Courtney at the other end of the pit lane. Back to team Vodafone, driver assistant here. So this is costing them. He's got to make sure, well no, there's fuel still going in. Just to go. Yeah, the door cost them there. Yeah. They dropped the car there. And they were ready to go, but they still hadn't managed to get Wing Cup strapped in. There's the other car. Where so they... Lowndes will come around and take over the lead of the race. Yeah, so they've swapped positions in all that. So that little door exercise cost them about four or five seconds thereabouts. Tandem meantime's just done the fastest lap of the race. So that's not bad on a full load of fuel, 35.74. So your leaderboard still has car 14. At the front of Jason Barguano, Shane Price driving, yet to come in for their second stop. Craig Baird, Lee Holdsworth, Paul Morris and Marcus Marshall are the five drivers out there who still need to come in for their second pit stop. So your effective race leader is now Craig Lowndes in car 888 with Wing Cup behind him. Here's car six of Will Davison and Garth Tander behind him. Former winners of this race together now battling this race and this is for against position. each other. Four position, exactly for effective third position. And these two cars sat on the front row of the grid. These two guys have partnered before and won this race, as you say. And uh, Tander's got a quick car. We've just talked about the fastest lap that he's done. Shane Van Gisbergen's talking about a problem with the shift cut in the SP Tools car as well, which means it's not shifting gear properly. Tander down the inside. And he was very forceful then, and Will wanted to argue, but realised it would have ended in contact. So up goes Tander one spot. That takes him up to eighth. But in real terms, Lowndes is the corrected race leader. Then Winkup, then Tander, then Davison. So effectively, Garth Tander's just put himself into third position. And you're right, it was an aggressive move. On the back of the fastest lap of the race, Garth Tander knew that if he can get past Will Davison early, he can put the hammer down and take advantage straight away. So he did so. Will Davison saying this car has got no rear grip at all. So he's talking about the car on screen there, the trading post Falcon, clearly not very well balanced on a full load of fuel at the moment. And maybe the rear tyres have overpressured a little bit. They're saying. Let's make some anti-roll bar adjustments on that car. There's the two levers right in the centre, down low, that uh, he'll be reaching for and trying to adjust. He'll be wanting to stiffen up the front bar and soften off the rear bar to try and correct that imbalance in the vehicle. Shane Price is the leader. There's about five cars yet to take their second stop.
Edging towards the halfway mark now at the LNH 500, this 113 lap event. Lee Holdsworth and Marcus Marshall out there, one and two, but they will have to come through pit lane. Lowndes is the leader, Wing Cup's behind him. Gartanda is effective third, and in pit lane on your mega wall, a lot of the responsibility for that position goes to that young man, Nick Perkat. Brett, you got him. Yeah, Matty, he's got to be content for man of the match today. Nick, boy, to regroup after that start and go on to get the result you did was outstanding. T take us back, what happened at the start? Um, so basically we rolled up to the line like normal and I've uh, had a little bit to go to get into the box. So I brought the clutch up a bit and my mistake, it stalled the car. So um, that was the first error and then I went to start it again. I could just hear the solenoid kicking. So I'm bashing everything inside basically to try and get to fire and uh, tell him down the radio that we need to rock the car to get it to try and turn the gear on the starter motor and start the thing. So um, they finally got it started and then, uh, obviously started pit lane. and. Uh, uh, had Al on the radio, keep you cool, and um, I think we yeah, passed about 20 odd cars, and um, the car's great. Uh, we've uh, went back on a change from this morning, and it's made the car right back to where it was yesterday, so GT will be um, all over it, I think. It's uh, brought him back, hopefully, into a decent position to get back up there. I reckon you've done that, Nick. Um, you kept your cool beautifully, and Neil Crompton said earlier today, careers will be defined today, and I think you might have had a career-defining moment today. Hopefully. I did say yesterday, sink or swim, and I think I uh, started to drown myself and then recovered, so it's uh, <laughs> all good. I hope uh, hope we can finish it off strongly. The car's good, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing GT at the end. Not bad, Nick. Good stuff. Thank Thank you. Himself, threw himself a life, boy. You reckon um, it's going to be not too far in the distant future we'll be calling Nick Perkat in the main game full-time? Oh, with drives like that, there'd be no doubt. I mean, plenty of people up and down here watch all this stuff with great detail, analyse what goes on, and they'll see the job that he's done. And, and he's done both, really. He's done sink and swim today, as he said. So, in, And uh, great to see the honesty there. Made a mistake at the start, but we recovered from it. When you consider where he was at the end of the first lap of the race, starting from pit lane and stone last, and then being able to climb back up, and Garth is in contention. So, with one stop against his name, Lee Holdsworth is the leader of the race. 15 second margin from Craig Lowndes, then Jamie Wincup, who just a moment ago did a very quick lap. Marcus Marshall next, he's slightly out of sequence on one stop two. And then Garth Tander next in the queue, fifth with uh, two stops. This is a very, very interesting motor race now from this point. A little upshift problem on the Shane Van Gisbergen car in position seven. On screen there, the blue car on the right. James Courtney behind him after Cam McConville did the opening duties for car number one. Couldn't have asked for a better day on the island. Couldn't have asked for a better racetrack on the island. So what's really interesting here is the battle that looms between the charging Tanda, who in corrected terms is third in this race, 12.7 seconds off Jamie Wincup. There's really nothing in it between 88 and 888. And 
those guys are currently separated on the racetrack by 0.7 of a second and they're only a lap apart on strategy so they're pretty much got the same fuel load pretty much got the same tire condition so it's just a fair fight between the two guns in 88 and 888 and this guy here now garth's got to be super careful though because if he goes berserk early and he's done enough of this to know exactly how to handle it then uh, he could hurt the tires so on the one hand he's trying he's trying to bridge this gap uh, but on the other hand he's got to try and nurse the tires a little bit this little bit of traffic here will be hindering jamie wincup car three the wilson security entry because dale wood's behind the wheel of that one because wincup was chipping away time wise against his teammate and in fact the last lap he did a 135.7 and craig lounce did a 136.1 and uh, dale just pulling left now on the exit of turn three to give Jamie Wink up some space and we probably should take the opportunity to say hi to Tony Delberto who's I'm sure at home feeling crook, feeling even worse about the fact that he's watching his race car on television, Wilson Security Entry. And his mates have put spots all over it just to <laughs> rub right. it in. Yeah, so I hope you're well Tony and uh, get back soon. We'll see you at Bathurst in a couple of weeks and I'm sure the boys will pluck those red spots off in a hurry for you. So Lee Holtworth yet to pit. A quite fascinating opening stanza of this race. I think Mark Scaife's on the line down there in Team Vodafone. How do you read it, Scaife? Good job. Yeah, thanks, Matty. It's been, uh, it was a very exciting start. Uh, there's a lot of cars, obviously, that are in contention with this race. Obviously, the, the uh, Andrew Thompson, Jamie Wincup car was very strong, and, and I didn't want to get involved. I mean, it's way too early for us to have a race for the lead when anything can happen in this race. So when Andrew was coming back at me again. I, uh, I let him by and, and just hung on there behind. So it's, the car feels quite good. Um, it's one of those races uh, when the conditions have changed. You know, we spoke earlier today about the wind direction. It's the first time we've pro properly run with the wind coming from the south. So there's three or four spots that are e very easy to trip you up coming into turn four through the hay shed and also down into the first corner. It can be way deeper, almost 50 metres deeper under brakes at turn one. Mate, it was a carbon copy of what you guys did last year. So is it the case of if it ain't broke, you know, don't try and fix it? Yeah, look, uh, Strategy-wise? Yeah, well, that's right, Matt. I mean, we, we did the same thing last year with the co-drivers starting. Uh, we wanted to, you know, what you've got to do, it's a little bit like Bathurst. You've got to be there with 20 or 30 laps to go, with a car in really good nick, with good tyres to put on at that stage. And we've got green tyres for the last stint, for both Wing Cup and Craig. So what we've got to do is get, you, you buy a ticket to that last 20 or 30 laps. Scafi, it's Larko, mate. I just want to ask you a question. Uh, you had that contact with Andrew Thompson early in the race. I noticed you drilled his right hand door. Now it was the right hand draw that pulled him up in their pit stop that allowed you to go past. Mate, that takes experience. Nice work. I was just about to say, Larko, that's just experience. I've seen you do the same thing before. Obviously, I didn't mean to run into him, but it was, it was on me. I'm going to hold down to turn four. And when we got it turned in, because you're on cold tyres, the car started to run wide. And I thought, oh, this is going to make contact here. So I knew that up Roland and Adrian and all the guys in the crew here would be off their brave, but it was fine. It, it hardly hit. It was no drama. Scafi, it's been a while since you've uh, leapt off the line in a V8 supercar, even longer since you've had to go through a false start procedure. So I'll bet your heart rate went right up and then right down and then had to go back up again. It would have been hard for an old bloke. Uh, actually, Crompo, it seriously was because when you do it all the time, those sorts of things you take in your stride. When the, when the yellow lights came on and the set start delayed, I'm going to the boys on the radio. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because <laughs> I didn't know whether basically the, we all took off and we come back around or whether we basically, you know, we, we just turn the engine off and save fuel or whatever you did. So you're absolutely right. I mean, when, as I said, when you don't do it all the time and you've got to go and recapture that anxiety and get yourself ready again, I found that quite hard today. That was actually a pretty diff difficult part of the race. Uh, you weren't alone in the what are we going to do stakes. There was uh, 27 other guys around you. So what now? Massage for you, mate? You're... Go, oh. back, go back to your Winnebago, were you? Or? Well, look, Matty, the, the unfortunate part for me is I'll end up having a beer with you two blokes tonight, <laughs> so that'll, that'll knock me around. Yeah. I'm just going to go and lock the commentary box, yeah. at, uh, commentary box door. I'll be back in a sec. That's all from Mark Scaife today. See you later, mate. Good job. Well done. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good work, mate. So Lee Holdsworth yet to pit. He's uh, at the front of the field, but will have to come through pit lane. So Lowndes in car 888 will be, is your effective race leader. And there's his teammate behind him, Yes. Dragging a bit of dirt as he gets around Dale Wood. So it took a while for Jamie Wincup to release himself of Dale Wood traffic in front of him. Holdsworth and Ritter still to come in. Lowndes and Scaife, the pairing who won it last year, are in control, but there's still 57 laps to go.
first gear. Get ready. Get loads of gear. Ready to go, mate. Ready to go when you are. Left throttle. Take it easy. OK, let's go. Let's go. Good job, mate. The field has been cleansed again as we continue live V8 supercar racing here on 7. So now we've got a, all systems go on lap 60 out of 113. So we've tipped over to the second half in terms of laps. Craig Lowndes is the race leader. He's behind the wheel of car 888. Jamie Winkup is second. That's the Pepsi Max crew just in between them, but Winkup will get around there so that's the difference that's the gap between first and second in this race team Vodafone one and two great chopper shot from the coach hire chopper looking around Siberia so the gap that I'm really focused on at the moment is the margin between Lowndes and Tandit it's still 12 and a half seconds first to third near enough to nothing in real terms between Lowndes and Wind Cup and as Mark Scaife explained a few moments ago it's too early in the race to go crazy you can't win it at this point you can just give yourself the opportunity to buy the ticket to the last sequence in it and that's what everyone's trying to do so Lowndes win cup tander they're in the game I was concerned about Will Davison's remarks that that car was really bad in the rear he's on screen there at the moment that's the real downside I said before that it wasn't a real drama that Luke didn't have a radio because you can get around it with lots of other things but I'll tell you where you are weak when you when you're carrying some form of balance wound and the car's not behaving the way that you want you don't get the opportunity to share it with your engineer so they don't get the opportunity to gear up for it when you come in so to correct a little understeer a little oversteer or some other issue with the car within the very short spectrum of things very narrow spectrum that they can deal with there's not much that they can do it's been a tough day so far for team boc car eight jason bright andrew jones drive through penalty as a result of what happened a contact with Stephen Richards I, I sort of suspected that they'd be stronger and I'm sure Brad Jones did too I haven't seen much of him this weekend it's a busy weekend for everybody in the paddock but, uh, looks like it's going to be Bathurst before we see them making a big impression he's down in 23rd position at the moment actually make that 22nd now Jason Bright and he's a minute and 23 seconds off the lead of the race Jonathan Webb position 23 sharing with Richard Lyons he's down in 23 and thanks to the Mother Energy Racing Team for letting us uh, park ourselves in your garage today. They've got some Star Wars effects going on on the front of car number 19. Picked up some sponsorship to go to the dark side. Star Wars on the top and on the bonnet. Good looking car. And John O'Webb is in 22nd position. Richard Lyons have made mention of the fact that he's the uh, only driver here this weekend to take on Philip Island for the first time, although he's had some uh, performances before in V8 supercars, hasn't driven one for about four years, and some rear panel damage flapping in the wind it's on the left-hand side of this uh, car. Rear bumper's had a bit of a workout on both sides, so race control typically looks at those things pretty carefully. They're rightly concerned about anything getting away from a car. In fact, I can... I can hear Tim Schenken discussing that at the moment in race control. Doesn't look like a drama. Doesn't look as though it's going to rip off at any stage. Well, the fixings Soon. are still all in place there at the moment. So there's your margins in the bottom right-hand corner. Lowndes and Scaife. That's a familiar call at this time of the year. And uh, they're engrossed in a huge battle with Jamie Wincup, Andrew Thompson, position two. And Tanda, it's three tenths of a second better off than he was before. 12.3 off the lead of the race.
That's position five there here in the LNH 500. Craig Lowndes leads this race. That's Marcus Marshall. We're taking a look at the Fujitsu entry of Marshall and Caruso, car 34. They're in fifth spot. Now, Chairman Tony Cochran talking with Gary Rogers, the team boss. Larko, what have you got? Uh, sorry, mate. I just uh, probably walked straight into camera. I've got Cheryl here from uh, GRM. Now, you look, if you look at the pit uh, sequence at the moment, there's only one car out there. It's done one stop. Everyone's done two. We're going to do some more. Now, you're talking, Sean. We talked about it at the start of the show the possibility that someone might try and do this in two stops. You're saying to me you can do it on fuel. Definitely. Yeah, we've got the fuel numbers to do it. The guys have been working it out. We can make it on two. Tire degradation is a little bit of an issue, but if the safety car falls our way, we can definitely do it. And how are you doing? Are the drivers driving economically, or we know we've got the little dial in there where you can lean off the engine? What are you doing? Yeah, we have had to use that a little bit, but it's not hurting our lap time. So what we've got at the moment will get us to the end on one more stop, as long as the tyres hang in there. If the safety car falls our way, we might switch to a three, but we'll just see how it pans out. Good on you, mate. I love the fact that you guys push the boundaries. Well done. One critical component there, safety car, and it's come to pass. Right on cue. Can you believe it? Flying animals at the turn four. Okay, so there's uh, sounds like there's some birds or something on the racetrack. To Tim, say, so I, I was about to say the key words in Kevin's answer there were, you know, the safety car. That was the bit that they needed to be able to uh, make their strategy work. And uh, there's just been no evidence of it all day. Everybody's been driving very, very well, but uh, there's something going on out at the race circuit. The race director has called the safety car. Now this was earlier when the Gulf Western Oils car came in and out, the dry brake fuel said, ah, oh, there's geese on the track. We've said that before today, but they're real ones this time. So uh, that fuel in the dry brake system, it didn't seal when they pulled it back. This is not good. Uh, so now, who was that? Was that 88 or 888? 888, so Lowndes is in. Wind Cup's gone in as well, so they're going to have to stack these two, and it's not easy in this pit lane. Short fills later in the day, that's the benefit for them with this strategy. Tanders come in as well, top three have come in. Top four have come in. Will Davis has gone in. So, Team Vodafone are going to have to queue them up, as they do. Lowndes is there first.
Wind cups behind him. There is Will Davison. Lights got, uh, flashing. But this is, that really hurts 88. Uh, now this has got my little propeller spinning because um, it, it, it plays, it certainly plays the Fujitsu cars back in on that strategy that Shaw was talking about. Look at that, 88's just lost the position. Another one. Two positions yeah. lost for Jamie Wincup. So Garth Tander moves up to second, Will Davison will go up to third and Wincup drops to fourth. That's a big change. Now there's a, a control line there that determines who has right of way. So it's worked for one side of the Team Vodafone garage, but not the other. You brought the family pets down, Crompo. Keep them in that cage that you've got. Yeah, we've, um, we've seen the, the waterfowl down here before and seagulls and, and there are geese in various lakes and things in and around the property. And uh, when there's testing and tyre testing and stuff on down here, it becomes a bit of an issue that you've got to be very, very careful of. Obviously, uh, nobody wants to be harming the wildlife down here. It's James Moffat exiting pit lane. Behind him is Dean Fiore. Jason Bright. David Brabham. Tim Slade. So the Petters safety car, <laughs> right on cue, comes into play and it's worked against Jamie Wincup. It's worked in favour of car 33, Greg Ritter. But they did it at such a time that they got in, got their fuel and got back straight out behind the safety car without having been buried further down the field. So, uh, yeah, so that's that hasn't been as bad as I thought it might have been, depending on where everybody fell and how the safety car picked them up. So basically, got the, they just got, they got in and got a full load of fuel for their trouble, freshen up the tyres. So the order is Lowndes, Tander, Davison, Will Davison, Wing Cup now fourth, Steve Owen two stops next to his name fifth, Greg Ritter two stops, sixth, same for Stephen Johnson two stops, then Shane Van Gisbergen and James Courtney. So effectively, count, Wink, uh, count Owen, Ritter and Johnson out of that leading equation of Van Gisbergen and Courtney. Anybody that uh, taken the stop late in this process will get really buried because they'll be right at the end of the train. I, I thought I intercepted a message that said that Wind Cup only took two rears on then, which probably stands to reason because the fronts would be young anyway, but we'll verify that. So 47 laps to go of this race. Bit of a wildlife crossing down at turn four was the reason for the safety car. Not only do we not want to harm any wildlife, but they can have dire consequences in terms of um, when the race cars collect them. So cool heads all round, and we'll go into another phase of this race. Well, Matty, in an earlier phase, Andrew Thompson uh, did his bit for Team Vodafone. Uh, interesting uh, first stint for you, Andrew. Yeah, you know, we, we got a good start. We, we, uh, we didn't really lose any spots. Managed to pick a few cars off. Uh, we got a little bit of a, bit of a nudge from Scafie on, uh, at, at, at Honda so that uh, when we got to our pit stop where Jamie had to get in, uh, you know, we just couldn't get the door open. So I did my foot to, to jam the door open. So we lost a bit of time and we, we lost a couple of spots because of that. But, um, you know, Jamie's, Jamie's going well. Safety car, you know, it's fallen probably, you know, equal for a run. So you know, I'll be interested to see how it plays out uh, in this later part of the race. Well, you did your bit to get the car in a great position. Well done. Yeah, thank you. He did a good job, Andrew Thompson. He's the current leader in the Fujitsu Development Series. Look at the activity going on here in pit lane, and you wanted to see what they did with car 88? Yeah, it is rears only, so I opened up that question, and yeah, so they just, uh, to try and get a bit of the time back there from the queuing, they didn't, they didn't do all four, and uh, no real need to change those fronts anyway. No doubt about it, Garth Tander will be one to watch on the restart here. Lowndes is 
so experienced that he will have ultimate control from the front of the field, but Lounce, uh, Tander has shown straight up that oh. he's very aggressive today. There's a Lounce-esque performance on turn 12 to get this restart underway. The first of the day after the first safety car. And off they go. Up over the rise, back down the hill. What will Tander do? Will he wait? Will he think about it? Will he pounce early? Will Davison's behind him. And uh, Garth Tander was questioning how early Craig Lowndes went then. There's a rule regarding that, how hard you can go after the safety car's peeled off. But Lowndes was sliding. He's taken on four tyres on that car, so remember that they'll all be cold. So just for clarity, Lowndes, four fresh cold tyres. Wind Cup, two fresh rear tyres only. Turn so four this is a dog, a dog fight from here. Greg Ritter goes on the inside. Tander had a look at Lowndes there at the right hand of the hairpin. This won't be fueled to the finish, by the way, folks. In case you're asking that question at home, they need, unless there's a very big safety car intervention, they will need one further stop before they can get these cars home. Lounce the defending champion here with Mark Scaife. Garth Tander won the first two LNH 500s. He had Scaife next to him in 08, Will Davison next to him in 2009. Down to turn 10. Inside's where they make their mark, and James Courtney does so on Stephen Johnson. So that's for eighth for James. So uh, fresh tyres also on Tander's car. If you remember at the beginning of the previous stint, Tander was very, very quick on fresh tyres with a full fuel load. At one point, he punched out the fastest lap of the race. On that subject, Lowndes has just done a 135.6. Well, the rubber flying up off the track just off the racing line. So there's a real sprint race on between these two right now. And uh, after the shocking run that they had at Queensland Raceway, those that are in second and third at the moment, the teams, Toll Holden Racing Team and Trading Post Racing, be well pleased to see their cars at or near the front of this race. This is a fascinating battle at the front. The free-flowing flamboyant lounge against the ultra-professional Garth Tander. They've both got their race faces on at the restart. And Greg Ritter putting pressure here on Steve Owen. It makes the story more about raw pace and hand-to-hand -hand combat now than who's on what strategy, which is uh, always a little more exciting. So these guys now are hard at it. Now, if they ran all the way to the end of that fuel load, on average, that's going to get them to a roundabout lap 102. Remember, it's a 113 lap race. So it'll be a squirt and go right at the very end of this race. Oh, look at that, Shane Van Gisbergen. Oh, right, tucked up in behind. And so was Ritter, all locked up. Oh, Van Gisbergen's trying to avoid the mess. And he'll get through on the inside of Greg Ritter but we'll tuck in behind Steve Owen. So Ritter ended up giving Owen a push down to turn 10 and now the Giz comes through. So he'll go up to fifth. Remember that Steve Owen was a real star here at this event last year and on the strength of this outing and also at Bathurst, he earned the ride for the VIP Pet Foods entry. Look at this down the inside, Ritter not surrendering at all and that's a big brave move that you got to pull down there at turn one. Courtney stalking in the background. He only does the endurance seasons through, uh, endurance races throughout the season, Greg Ritter, but he's certainly slotting in very well in terms of racecraft and aggression. Here we go. There's the lead. Lounce, Tander. Third is Will Davison. Fourth, Jamie Wincup. Fifth, Shane Van Gisbergen. Ritter, sixth. Seventh now goes to James Courtney, who tucks in on the inside of Steve Owen. And in case you're wondering, just in terms of that whole queuing process, in the pit lane. The teams are only permitted one boom. It's just limited room in all these pit lanes all around the countryside. So there's one boom. So in this case, the leading car had the priority for Team Vodafone. So Lowndes was in, got serviced. Wind Cup, it's the lesser of the two evils. If you left him out there, the field would condense. You bring him in, service him, send him out. He'd be on the tail of the train. That's no good. So what they did was they queued him, serviced the car, did the rear tyres only, and sent it back out. Now he's battling for fourth instead of second but it's not so bad. Here it is again from above the chopper, the big lockup, Greg Ritter. 
And uh, Shane Van Gisbergen taking an opportunity around the outside to put the move on the Fujitsu car. And third of a lap later, he did the same on the VIP car. Look at this, that's Tanda. Full-blown sprint car action onto the front straight. Right rear, totally in the gravel. Look at this, it's tightened right up at the top because Lowndes and Tanda are right at it now. One tenth of a second is the official margin. They're on their 71st lap of 113 and it's turned all the way around now back into a full-blown sprint race. Tanda's got pace. Maybe Lowndes is not willing to hammer the tyres too much or maybe he doesn't quite have the balance that he's looking for. Will Davison, meanwhile, continues to hold off his former housemate in Jamie Wincup. So Vodafone leads Holden Racing Team, leads Ford Performance Racing with Team Vodafone again behind that. This battle here, though, is incredible. Both of these guys have won 500s. They've both won up at Bathurst. They've both won championships. They're both as good as it gets. Lowndes and Tanda in two super fast cars are going at it full throttle here at Phillip Island. Live V8 supercar racing on seven. How good is this? Shallow climb out of the hill there for Tanda. Drove the car very square. He doesn't want to overload the rear tyre. Jason Bush, Alistair McVean. Mike Henry in the background of the Toll Holden Racing Team bunker. I don't like think anyone's breathing in there. It's like a different world, isn't it? Back onto Gardner Straight. Let's do a lap speed check. 136.1 for Lowndes, a 136.2 for Tanda, a 136.3 for Will Davison, who's a couple of seconds behind in third. 36.5 for Wind Cup. Two little groups of two here in command of this race at the moment. And the big push from Tanda has just eased ever so slightly in that last half a lap, but he's very strong down at the southern end of the racetrack here. This is turn three. Some mind games too, I reckon, Coppo being played, especially around at turn 10. The guard Tanda, a couple of times the last few laps, has had a little watching brief on the outside, knowing that Lowndes would be looking for him on the inside. We'll see what they do when they get around there this time. But 33, 15 and 16 all bundled together around turn four. So Greg Ritter holding off Rick Kelly and David Reynolds. Lowndes continues to hold off Gar Tanda through the hay shed. Lowndes Top speed. Sliding just a little bit more through hay shed then than, than Tanda as well. So he's going to have to watch that very, very carefully. See how tight and straight Tanda can drive that car at the moment. He had it right on the ideal line for turn in. So Lowndes appears to be using a little bit more of the road at the moment than Tanda. And then these guys, I mean, it's just as strong this battle, Matty, for third and fourth. Greg Ritter at the moment's got himself in the middle of an almighty brawl because he's seventh. He's got Rick Kelly, David Reynolds all trying to attack him as well. So it's welcome back to V8 Supercar Racing for Greg. Look at this, Tanda stalking in the draft. 280, 285, 290 kilometres an hour. Looks, but tucks back in under the wing of the Vodafone car. Just to let him know that he's there. Remember, this car, car number two, started from pit lane in the hands of a man who'd only driven one V8 supercar main game race before, Nick Perkat. He did a great job to hand it over to Tanda, who is now fighting tooth and nail for the lead of the first endurance race of the season. Will he have a look at turn four? He's close enough. There's something flapping beneath that car of Tanda's too. If you look just under about where a front passenger would be sitting, it might only be a bit of tape or something, but there is something flapping beneath that car. Looks like some sort of tape. It's certainly not doing anything adverse to his speed. Well, it could be related to whatever was going on at the line, so uh, we just keep an eye on that. Nothing wrong with the pace at the moment, though, as you said, Matt. They've gone absolutely across the control line at the end of the first sector with virtually identical lap speed. They're coming up to the second sector line now. Again, Lowndes a little shallow on the turning point. Tander able to drive on the ideal race line. It's tightened up between Davison and Wincup as well. Oh, oh, nasty business down at turn one. Murphy. Oh. Got it back on. Incredible. Another one. 
virtual replay of the last lap. Now, they've just... Another look on the inside from Tanda. That one was much deeper, though. And a little bit more aggressive. He stayed out there a bit longer just to let Lowndes know that he's ready to have a crack. This is where he closes the gap. The southern loop. What's this at the exit of turn two? Tanda's so good around here. Team Vodafone watching on. Scaifey, top left. Tyler Holden, racing team, bottom left. Will Davison now reporting the opposite of what we heard from him at the beginning of the stint. He said it's got chronic push, which means it's understeering now. At the beginning of the stint, it was oversteering. So he's a busy boy trying to get the right balance. And uh, I didn't quite catch all the information, but they suggested to Garth that he can play with the fuel trim in the car as well. So uh, I imagine, given that they're not fuel critical at the moment, that that, that message, if it were my drive, would be turn it up, hose some fuel into it and use every last brake horsepower that you've got at your disposal. Yeah, it's an interesting one though, Neil, isn't it? Because, you know, if these guys are all going to pit around with 10 laps to go, it's really going to be who has the shortest fuel stop. So I'm just thinking myself now, I wonder if you could get in his draft and get out of the throttle just a little bit here and there, conserve a little fuel, because it's going to be all about the fuel stop, mate, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but it's going to be such a short one. You know, for such a short stint, Larko, that you wouldn't think a few litres one way or another is going to make a huge difference, but you may be onto something there. Here's that incident that we saw before, and I've only just started to breathe again after this. This is Paul Dunbrell and oh. Greg Murphy. Murphy off on the outside at turn one. Oh, goodness me, that's spooky stuff. It's a 220 kilometre an hour approach into turn two, and it's a 290k approach. Oh, here we go. Trouble here for Nathan Pretty. Nathan Pretty, car 30. Uh, 290 into turn one, 220 into turn two, and you probably sit at about 210 in the middle of turn one. So pick a speed, but whatever it was for Greg Murphy, it's fast. It's fast. <laughs> a great control though for Murph to get it back on. The grass is dry here, flicked a lot up onto the circuit. And this battle royale is quite extraordinary. We reckon that they'll be sitting still for about 14 seconds to get the last load of fuel if you take into account the happy hour of winding up the fuel trim in the car. Davey Reynolds is about to break free of Greg Ritter. So that puts Reynolds up into eighth. And yet again, car 61 has been the opportunist. Last time we saw that move, it was Craig Baird behind the wheel. Now Fabian Coulthard, uh, Coulthard in the Bundy Run entry. So Fabian goes up to ninth. I think Mark Larkham's point's a good one earlier, though, the fact that uh, Van Gisbergen's got closer to this battle now, so this is three-way tie for third, fourth, fifth. Uh, it could well end up being a battle resolved in a pit lane rather than on a racetrack if these two stay locked in this sort of combat. It'll, oh, look at this! Up the inside, done! Nice work, Shane Van Gisbergen. Jamie Winkup won't want a bar of that. Here we go. Oh, for He's the lead get. on the inside and one. Oh. Unbelievable. And Tanda's got it done. Slides out the other side. You do not often see that move in V8 supercar racing. Wow. He signaled it a few laps before and then took an almighty deep breath and made it happen. Garth Tanda takes over the lead of the race and puts the Toll Holden Racing Team within striking distance of an amazing 200th race victory. That was a great move. I don't know whether Craig had a little bobble on the exit of the last corner. This is the move for Van Gisbergen on wind cup from above in the chopper back up at the northern end of the circuit, half a lap back. So basically he's just uh, been able to climb out of the hill better, better traction on the short shift, second to third, and then to fourth into the final corner. Here's the replay. Out of the draft for Tanda, and straight down the inside. And then that delays Craig getting back on the throttle, but how's the slide? I mean, that's a huge slide there for Tanda. I was wondering how he's going to pull it up. So was he, I reckon. <laughs> Here it is again. Oh, gee, this is gutsy. This is a huge move. See how much he had to control that car to get it back on the racing line. There's Nick Perkat, his co-driver. There's Craig's co-driver, Mark Scaife, now sitting in second position on lap 76 out of 113. Tell you what, though, Matty, I dip my hat to both these competitors. That was great motor racing. Great move by Garth Tander.
Great recognition by Craig Lowndes not to end up creating a problem as a result of it. We've got one heck of a motor race on our hands. It's back on in pit lane. Team Vodafone have come in. Importantly, the race leader, the man who we watched do all that hard work to get around Craig Lowndes, Garth Tander came in straight away after. Yeah, but this is really interesting now because it's put car two and car triple eight on different strategies. And Team Vodafone opted to bring Win Cup in as well and do the same as what Tander's done. So um, they're now fueled to the end. Garth's got four brand new tyres on that car. He's going to try and make maximum advantage in this phase of the race. But of course, he's got to do a whole stint on uh, these tyres and they'll be pretty tired towards the end. I'd be curious to see what they do with Lowndes now and how they play this, Larko. Neil, I'm just down here, mate. This is where it's going to get really exciting, mate. Oh, he's in. Yeah, and four green tyres sitting out on the pit lane for Lowndes as well. Watch this space. Yeah, so uh, they've reacted. They've reacted to that. They need to cover him. So Tander trying to do what you may hear them describing in Formula One here, basically sort of an undercut, trying to get an advantage out of that green tyre now for this next lap, but they're bringing in car six, Will Davison as well. He's been complaining about balance issues, so look for a tweak on that car. Here's Tander 
pushing this thing within a millimetre of its life on cold tyres through the hay shed. Van Gisbergen's the leader of the race. He's complaining of an intermittent misfire or an upshift problem with the SP Tools entry. Straight entry here for Lowndes. Couple up the fuel. All four tyres being changed. Also minimises their exposure to any safety car intervention that they don't get trapped. Now, released, gone, round the cone marker. Here comes Tanda. Where do they all wind up? It's going to be very, very close. Tanda at speed. Lowndes bringing up to speed. Does he chop him? No. They go back to almost precisely as they were. What a car race. Craig on cold tyres. Garth Tanda has completed a flying lap and really wrung the neck of car number two on his first lap out. And the battle is back on. This one will go all the way to the end. So they're fueled to the end. Doesn't matter whether the safety car comes out, they don't get trapped. They've taken the opportunity to get this all tidied up early. They didn't run long on that last stint. Will Davison is behind them. Jamie Wincup is behind Will. So it's situation almost exactly the same. It's incredible how you can process your way through pit lane and still pop out in exactly the same manner. Here's the important message here as we go back and have a look at something a bit further down the field. 14 and 7, Bargwana and Todd Kelly. On the tap two, tap three taps. And they were in the same team previously, so just a little bit of touching there. But in this whole process, the people that we've got a lot of focus on at the moment, these key leaders in this enormous battle, it does take them back down the order. So they're 15th and 16th. But remember that everybody north of them at the moment has got to put fuel in to get themselves home. Scafey, really interesting strategy play out there, mate. Um, what we did wrong, Lansing was actually on two tyres, maybe costing him a bit of performance. Four greens on there now. Good work. Yeah, well, uh, we, we only needed to do a reasonably short stint to get to your critical number. And when we got to the critical number, we wanted to have the best tyre condition. So we put four green tyres on at the end. The two green tyres did hurt us in terms of balance compared to Garth. So Garth had better speed. But now our, our strategy is, as this run goes on, our car's been very good. So the early part of this stint, when they're both on greens, it won't be too much difference. But hopefully late in the race, I think it'll be pretty good. Ripping into the race, mate. Now, is it true the rumour? Those, fly, those flying animals they talked about over there at Turn 4. Is it true you got changed? Your, your wallet fell on the ground, opened up. Bats, moths, prehistoric animals. <laughs> you, your dinosaur arms. <laughs> Never been to the bottom of your pocket ever. They were neutral coloured geese, they were grey, they weren't red or blue, so there's no conspiracy theories involved in it. So now Wincup's done the fastest lap of the race, a 35-6. And that's interesting because Mark's just picked up on the fact we've got a wallaby out there now. It's a great escape. All we need's a whale and we'll have a complete set. Lowndes looks much more comfortable now in this car. He's managed to come right up behind Garth Tander without having to push it too hard. Tanda really cut loose on his first lap. I was going to say that uh, in Mark's uh, conversation there, talking about the two tyres on Craig's car, the information that we got in that previous stop, not the one that we just saw, was that he took on four. So that explains a lot now about what the balance issue was. But look at this, he's back on him. And right on him too. Right on his hammer. Now using the draft. It's this the reverse. This is what Tanda did to Lowndes a few laps ago. Now Lowndes has a look. Has a thing, slots back in for turn one. And the fact that it was imbalanced means that the, that was the reason why Lowndes didn't get off turn 12 very well when Tanda made the attack. So his corner exit speed would have been down, which made him vulnerable to Garth at the end of the straight. So that kind of explains all that better to me now. They're 10th and 11th on the road, but those in front of them will have to go through pit lane again. So this is the battle here, and behind them, Will Davison is getting enormous pressure from Jamie Wincup, who's just done the fastest lap of the race. Got him, got him. Done. Just at the very last moment, right on the threshold of the brake performance, the tyre performance of that car. The other thing is, a key rival of all of these guys in Shane Van Gisbergen is now just in the pit lane. So they've left him a little longer, so you've got to keep an eye on him as well. And he was on a flying raid just before all that pit stop activity took place. So Van Gisbergen in, the SP Tools car. Meanwhile, Lowndes continues 
to stalk the rear of car number two, which started in pit lane. Amazing turn of events. Nobody's won a race in this championship's history from starting in the lane. And right now, Gartanda can turn those books upside down. So where does Van Gisbergen pop out? Here come the effective race leaders. Here they come. There goes Tanda. There's Lowndes behind him. The Gears comes out. Lowndes oh. has a look and Lowndes will get this job done back in oh. turn one. Tanda fights back and says, no, you won't, Mr. Lowndes. Keeps the lead. High Great. stakes. Great contest. Both gave each other room. A huge lunge by Craig Lowndes then. This is a real nail biter. Maximum attack from both. And Gisbergen back into effective fourth then. So, Wing Cup was clear of him, I believe, but it was so focused on this at the moment, and rightly so. Lowndes again, a look up the inside of turn four. Tanda just closes down slightly. There may have been gentle contact, I think there was. So close on the run up to turn six at Siberia. Nose to tail. Car so evenly matched. Drivers not giving a millimetre. Just when you think they're going to get it done, the other driver responds and shuts the door. Because they're going so fast, because they're pushing so hard, the tyre degradation here, the way in which they degrade, it's going to continue to increase. Watch for the move down the inside by Lowndes. Jumps out from underneath. He's got position. But Tanda hangs on, tries to make sure there's a tonne and a half in the way. Now he yields. Change wow. again for the effective race lead. What a beauty. So Lowndes now. Slots up to what is ninth position, but and effectively that's first. Fabian Coulthard, Russell Ingle, Jason Barguana, Marcus Marshall, Jason Bright, Alex Davison, John O'Webb, and Greg Murphy will all have to pit to get to the end of this race on lap 84 of 113. Which means there's 30 laps to go. So that last radio message before is a really critical one. And that is, you've got to look after these tyres. Eyes forward from Jeremy Moore to Craig Lance. You've got to look after the rubber. So where does that leave? Jamie Wincup, who's behind them and really hasn't had to do any battling. There he is. Look, he's arriving on the scene because he hasn't had to chew up his tyres. He hasn't had to fight off anyone. He had to get past Will Davison, but then found a little bit of clean air. This replay. This is down at turn one, the lap before. Check it out. Lowndes having a huge, huge lunge, but Tanda didn't, didn't resist in terms of closing him. He just stayed high, gave him a car width on the inside and still hung onto it on the outside. And here they are now at the other end of the circuit up at Lukey Heights and a crisscross for Lowndes. Bam, down the inside, late break. You've got to be careful you don't lock the rears when this happens. Garth spots him, leaves space, tries to hang the car up on the outside to just force the issue, but he didn't have the car up far enough in the end. I mean, that was a great exchange. Well done, boys. Lowndes has a fair chance here of backing up that move with the fastest lap of the race. He's done the fastest time to the second sector. Shane Van Gisbergen continues his charge. Wow. What a start to the season of endurance.
With 27 laps remaining now, Garth Tander finds himself under attack from another team Vodafone car in Jamie Winkup. That's who you're riding with. Effectively positioned third. Fabian Coulthard leads the race but will have to stop. Unless, of course, we get another safety car. Jason Barguana, Marcus Marshall, Jason Bright, John O'Webb and Greg Murphy. The top six cars yet to pit. And I think the word that we're going to thrash before now and the end of the race is we're watching James Courtney and David Reynolds action during the break. James locking up down the bottom of the hill and David on the big attack in the Stratco car. I think the word degradation is going to get a fair bit of use because I think that's going to be the talking point now. How tyres wear, how drivers look after them because Wind Cup now really attacking Tanda. You can see him locking the rears. Garth on the way down inside the left-hander, or should I say the right-hander down at turn 10 at the bottom of the hill there. Garth Tanda and... Uh, I reckon Shane Van Gisbergen might play in here as well, just looking at the numbers that we're currently seeing. Some sort of fluid going on the front of uh, Windcup's car there. On the front windscreen. Well, mate, on that trip, we need to round him up as quick as we can. I know you know this. You're doing a great job. <laughs> I'm telling you anything you don't know, but just do it anyway, if you don't mind. But I think when you go back to that battle that we spoke about, when Garth Tander was battling away with... Craig Lowndes, like I mentioned, Wing Cup had a bit of a free reign at that stage to just knuckle down, do quick times, and not degrade those tyres any further than the level that they're going off anyway. So that's allowed him to get track position and also allowed him to start having a look here at Garth Tanner at turn four. And there you go. He'll hold on, he'll hold on. Oh, Garth's going to fight back for this one. On the inside at turn five at Siberia. So good job, Tander. He continues to hold on and hold off Jamie Winkup. And now Winkup pushes away up the hill. Great battle. Again, a great battle between real professionals. These guys are just doing such a great job of racing so hard, but not actually serving it up to each other. And in the last stint, we've just run some numbers. Van Gisbergen, who's just looming in the background there in the Blue Falcon SP Tools car, he had the least amount of tyre degradation. There he is. So in the last tyre stint, he looked very good. And in fact, the one before looked pretty strong as well. So of the key runners, Dave Stewart's on the radio coaxing him at the moment. He is looking after rubber. So he's got a long margin to make up if he was... Seven Tander is a 36 six. That's Dave Stewart. So, so that's Dave Stewart giving Shane Van Gisberg and the relative numbers of those that he's racing. He sees data on his dashboard as well. He knows his own lap speed. He's hearing what those around him are doing. It gives him an idea of how hard to push and what to regulate. So they're playing a game that's this delicate balance between pace and rear tire wear. I think we're just seeing that evidence at the moment that Tander might be in a spot of bother because of so hard, uh, how hard he was pushing early on. So there's effective first, not actually first in the race, but fifth Craig Lowndes. It's the margin, we'll swing back here. There's Jamie Wincup, sixth, effectively second. Then Garth Tander, then Shane Van Gisbergen is the next after this air gap. There he is. And it's Will Davison just behind him. Now, in front of them, Fabian Coulthard, who could be a factor. Just need to run some numbers on that. Marcus Marshall and Jonathan Webb, Greg Murphy. Four cars who will need to fuel before we get to the end of the race. Now, the reason I say Coulthard could be a factor, he's got a 13-second lead at the moment in the Bundy entry. He'd come in, stick some fuel in it. It's going to take a while to bring the fuel back up to the level he needs to get him to the end. But he's going to have very young tyres, and we think he'll drop in the back, back end of the top ten. And with very young tyres, particularly if all these guys are limping home, he could be a bit of a pest for a few of them, so we shall see. Captivating circuit and a captivating race. From the word go, when it even got off to a false start. Perkat couldn't get car number two going. Now, last time through, incidentally, Lowndes and Wind Cup in the high 35s. Now, the track comes to them at this time of the day. There's a bit more rubber. There's 
better understanding. They've trimmed up their cars. It's kind of the best things are going to be during the day, plus the temperature's tapering as well. There's the gaps. There's Van Gisbergen. There's Will Davison. Pole sitter. What a squat in that car as it leans on its rear, coming off the right-hander. Hairpin, turn four. Our battle here, car 7 and 33. This is Lee Holdsworth versus Todd Kelly. They're arguing over 14th and 15th, and that sound you can hear are the rocks flying up under the inner guards of the car at turn three. It's pretty much considered a given that Lee Holdsworth will be on the move next year. And that's something else that we've touched on this weekend with the other drivers coming into play, a lot of these guys are putting their hands up for permanent seats because there'll be a few chopping and changing at the season's end. Now Marcus Marshall and uh, Jonathan Webb have pitted, so this is further cleansing the field. So we'll have a full lap here of uh, Jamie Whitcup. This is his front left Dunlop control tyre that we're looking at. And that's him up in the top left-hand corner of screen. So. Watch the load on this tyre, and in this case at Turn 2, not very much of it, because it's barely touching the road. And then uh, next, the big fast sweeper, Turn 3, fifth gear, 250 kilometres an hour, and it waves to the geese down there. And then big crush under brakes into Turn 4, second gear. Big distortion where you ask the tyre to not only stop, but also turn for you. A little bit of kerbing to try and make the straightest possible line to what we call Siberia, Turn 6 just kissing the curbing there there it is second to third to fourth now the big right hander fifth oh, that, through that right hander at Haitian it's just an awesome bit of road and then over the top of the hill we've seen a couple of moves here this weekend looks like there might be one again now and that displaces Greg Murphy Lap down. So that gives you a bit of an idea of some of the loads that run through the car. Fourth gear onto the pit straight. It's 850 metres of wide open throttle on the run down to turn one. And watch this. distortion through there. It's pretty wild, isn't it? It's like so gooey black chewing gum. 210 kilometres an hour, the slowest speed they achieve in the middle of Turn 1. So Fabian Coulthard is the last driver to be cleansed. Craig Lowndes on the way to back-to-back -back LNH 500 wins.
Sorry. This enthralling V8 supercar race now goes down to the final 20 laps and this man's on a charge, a real charge, a podium charge, no less. Shane Van Gisbergen has got around Garth Tander to go up into third spot, seven seconds adrift of our race leader Craig Lowndes. And he's got pace, Matt, to the second sector then. He was six tenths quicker than the race leader. This is the move on Garth Tander at turn 10 and they run down from the top of the hill into that tight right hander, the second gear uh, turn. But this is a great run here from Van Gisbergen. I said earlier that his tyre numbers have been very good. And now he's taking aim at Jamie Wincup. You can see him. He's close enough to see the rear of car 88. Now let's run through the Mother Energy highlights of late. This is Andrew Thompson doing his best to get out of car 88. Some panel damage to that driver's side door came back to bite them in pit lane and it allowed car 888 to take the lead. But the safety car was called out because of some wildlife down there on the circuit at turn four. That triggered all sorts of chaos down in pit lane. Check out this, Greg Murphy, turn one, maximum speed over 200 kilometers on the grass, fights to get it back on. This battle will go down as one for the ages. Garth Tander against Craig Lowndes, both flying into turn one. Tander had signaled that move a couple of times and eventually got it done. You can't believe how gutsy that was. And then at turn 10, Craig returned the favor, but it wasn't an easy one. Finally pushed away from car number two to take over the race lead. In fact, Garth Tander would find himself in the same position with Lowndes' teammate in the other car, Jamie Wincup, because car double eight would then get in front of Tander, and so too, as you just saw beforehand, Shane Van Gisbergen. And so Garth Tander, at one stage, is leading this race, is now in fourth. Lowndes is the leader, Wincup second, the Gis is third. This battle you're looking at, car 33 of Lee Holdsworth with Todd Kelly and Jason Barkwana. Bark started from the rear of the field. So he's managed to move it up midfield now and did all the hard work in the opening segment. It was one of the rare cars that started with their regular drivers in instead of their co-drivers. And he's continuing to tap away at Todd Kelly. Former teammates on to the main straight. High speed, high stakes stuff. They're going to drag it down to turn one. A bit of balking, a bit of looking, a bit of pushing. Side by side. You'd think they're racing for the chequered flag. They're midfield and Kelly's going to hold on. There may be contact. A miracle if there isn't. And now Bargwana wants to look on the inside at turn two. Kelly wants to look on the inside at the exit of turn two and will muscle his way through. 
Oh, to see the slide Jason had then on the back end of turn two, that was nicely done. Todd Kelly, well done. Both of them, great driving again. Big slide for Barguana as the car just slid down the camber of the road there. Meantime, at the front of the field, Van Gisbergen continues to make very good lap speed. He's at 5.4 seconds off the lead. Here he is. He's just 0.8 away from Wind Cup. And we'll get a refreshed uh, lap speed on this lap. It's a 136.6 for Craig Lowndes. Next in the queue, Jamie Windcup, 136.5. But then it's a 36 even for Van Gisbergen. So he took 0.6 out of the two leaders on that lap. And that's a lot at this stage of the race. Look at this. There's going to be a change for position here shortly because this is obvious speed from the SP car. Good balance, good tyre management, good driving. And he and John McIntyre have put themselves in a position where they're strong when it matters most. Half a second faster last time around. Rear, rear brake, that time for Wind Cup into turn four. It just slid all the way into the corner so the rear tyres are hurting on this car. Watch up the inside now, job done. So that was pretty easy there for Van Gisbergen. P2. Now, next in the gun sights. <laughs> Five seconds up the road. The reigning champions. Neil, and one of the issues you talked about earlier on, I talked to Dave Stewart over here, his engineer, about the intermittent problem he's had with the gear cut. Now, on the throttle traces I can see, he's holding the throttle flat all the time, so that's not a drama. But I will just see if we can grab uh, Ross Stone just having a chat there. Just one sec. Roscoe, sorry mate to interrupt. Um, we're looking at uh, Shane's tyre degradation figures from that last run on his tyres, and he was the best in the field. Think he's strong enough here to go all the way? Well, they were used tyres. They have done some laps, so fronts off some of the other sessions. So uh, time will tell, as usual, but uh, we're not going to leave anything on the table. We're going to go for it. But I can see that. I was just saying, I was looking at his throttle traces there, mate. He's not leaving anything on the table. No, he's... Uh, He's pretty happy out there, car's really good. So, uh, just need a bit of time, see what happens here. All right, good luck. Well, you know what, if that's their strategy, they've got the right man for the job and leaving nothing behind in Shane Van Gisbergen. Yeah, and I've just uh, got some figures here, and I mean, there's no doubt I don't even need to read out the itty bitty detail, but Van Gisbergen, of the three key runners at the moment, has got less than half the amount of lap-by-lap uh, -lap tire degradation to the Vodafone cars. So 4.7 seconds is the gap. They're on lap 98 of 113. Have a look at this exchange here. Todd Kelly on the outside, Jason Barguana on the inside. This time, Kelly rooster tails onto the front straight. More than 200 kilometres an hour in fourth gear. It's going to end in tears, that one. And he's not happy. Here's the leader. Now, let's remember earlier today in the warm-up session, Craig Lowndes and Shane Van Gisbergen came together at high speed around this part of the circuit. In a heartbeat, Lowndes is going to have car number nine on his tail. The LNH 500 certainly not done with yet.
looking down on this world famous circuit, the Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit, and finding our race leader Craig Lowndes, the defending champ with Mark Scaife, now holding off Shane Van Gisbergen, who is 4.4 seconds. There he is, back down the road. So pretty much the entire length of the front straight. And Lowndes just punched out at 135.8 that lap, a 35.9 for Van Gisbergen. That's the first time in the recent past that Lowndes has actually climbed back up over Van Gisbergen to stabilise the gap at that 4.4 that you just mentioned. It's a question of, and then there were two, because Wing Cup now, a 36-7 on the last lap, he's basically out of the hunt. Shane's continuing to talk about this intermittent glitch, something to do with upshifting on the car. Comes and goes, there's team principal Roland Dane for team Vodafone, and uh, not in a mood to play at the moment. Heavy focus on what's going on here. So the story of this race, as we knew it would be, because we talked about it yesterday in the show and earlier today, it's about trying to manage your way to the back end of it and looking after those tyres, this tyre degradation that we talk about. This is the warm-up earlier in the day, by the way, that Matty made mention of in the, as we went to the break. This is the warm-up, I might mention, where Lowndes and Van Gisbergen got together. What we didn't see is that Craig touched Shane earlier in the lap and then Shane returned serve twice at high speed and the driving standards observer, Thomas Mazira, went and spoke to both of them and went, cut it out or and, else. And the other side of that was that Mark Larkin went and had a chat to Shane Van Gisbergen who said, hey, Craig Lowndes is very good for trying to smack around us young guys and I'm going to stand up to him. So that was in the warm-up. That's what happened in the warm-up earlier today. You can only imagine what may happen if in the last 10 laps of this race they get much closer than the four-second gap at the moment. 49, car 49 of Steve Owen on the inside of Alex Davison. This is down the back end of the top 20. Just on a serious point there though, the uh, officials are, are charged with the responsibility of you know, maintaining safe operation of everything for, for competitors, for officials and for spectators. So we don't want people playing silly games at more than 200 kilometres an hour. So they did the right thing and the, they both needed a talking to. And Shane, particularly doing that at high speed, that was, uh, that was right on the boundary line, in fact, over it. Uh, now, I was going to explain before about the tyre degradation thing that we talk about. It's, we're simply talking about tyre wear, either ex excessive heat or wear. They start out with just a little under four millimetres of tread depth in these Dunlop control tyres. Because of the high speed nature of the circuit, only just over 40% of the lap is 100% throttle. Tells you that there's 60 odd percent where you're turning, dancing the throttle, trying to wrestle the car at high speed. So there's an enormous load goes through the tyres. The rear tyres in particular hurt around here. And that's what we've been talking about in the comparison. And it appears as though the best setup and driving combination to look after those tyres, combination of speed and preservation, has been cars 888 and 9. And there's car 4 just wandering off the edge of the road. That's Alex Davison at the helm sharing with. Sports Car International and former Le Mans winner David Brabham. So Lowndes and Van Gisbergen have done the best job of that. Lowndes incidentally lost two tenths in this sector to Van Gisbergen on this lap. The gap's now under four seconds, 3.8 it was. We'll see what happens when they cross the control line, 3.8 it remains. So in that final sector there, Van Gisbergen just chipped away, as you mentioned, just a couple of tenths of a second. If it stays as it is, there it is, the confirmation graphic along the bottom there, Shane out in the weeds throwing rocks then. Um, Craig will have grabbed another 18 points in his quest to mow down Jamie Wincup in this championship. They came into the weekend 98 points apart, that's John McIntyre. That bloke doesn't need much introduction in this business. Peter Jamison on the commercial side of Team Vodafone on his left. Um, 18 points, pretty critical at the moment, Maddox. Started out a 98 point gap coming into the weekend, so you'd have it down to 80 points if they stay as they are, but we're not there yet. They drifted out to 108 after yesterday's qualifying points haul, so it's it's still tight regardless. And the traffic here in front of Lowndes may play a further part to this little game because Lowndes has had to get around, uh, or will have to get around some cars in front of him. Car 21 of Carl Reindler. And also the Jim Beam car there of Stevie Johnson. So Lowndes will need to negotiate that traffic. Van Gisbergen keeps the hammer down and will get closer if the pace continues the way it is. He's 
flying the flag for Ford at the moment, Shane Van Gisbergen. The Blue Oval hasn't won an enduro event since Bathurst in 2008. Get the feeling that it's going to go down to the very last lap because Van Gisbergen's not letting up. In fact, he's gaining ground. 3.5 seconds is the difference. Debris all over the circuit. The rubber's being chewed up and spat out, as you'd expect at the 100 odd lap mark of this race. Team Vodafone continue to look on. They look a little bit concerned because they know what's coming. There's Johnny McIntyre, three-time NZ V8 champion. I made some form guide notes before this event. Now, these guys came here, Van Gisbergen and McIntyre came here last year and finished 27th. They went to Bathurst and finished 21st. And the form guide this time around was much more promising for a number of reasons. Johnny Mack has more experience, comes off another winning year. But critically, Shane Van Gisbergen has had breakthrough victories in the V8 supercars this season. It's a big turnaround to be a supercar competitor to a supercar winner. Nine left to go, 3.3 of the gears. We know he's got speed, we know he's got hunger, now he knows how to win. Lowndes negotiating this traffic down to turn one. And Van Gisbergen took 0.4 of a second on that lap. Another guy that's making great gains at the moment is Jason Bright. He's down in ninth of the Team BOC entry. Here he is. He's got good tyres on the car and he's catching James Courtney at a great rate. Good fight back. That car had to trundle through pit lane under the stewardship of uh, Andy Jones for a penalty after ramming into the rear of Stephen Richards. That's his target, James Courtney, reigning champion, and there's Jason Bright. So Courtney last lap did a 37.4, Bright did a 36 even, so nearly one and a half seconds in that lap alone. And, well, you saw the visual gap. About uh, 4.1 seconds officially, according to the computer, between them. So on that rate, he's going to grab him in three laps. At the front, 3.2 seconds, 2.9 seconds is now the gap. So the other interesting thing now will be this traffic here. These two cars here, now Van Gisbergen has to negotiate them. Generally, once the lead has gone through, though, the lap traffic is more aware of the fact that there's something going on. So often they're kinder to the next bloke in the queue than they are when you're the first. So the way things are provisionally at the moment, Wing Cup could walk away from today, still leading the championship on 21.33. 80 points clear of Craig Lowndes, 2053. Shane Van Gisbergen, third, 17 at 52. What are the numbers? 136.3 for Lowndes, 136.1 for Van Gisbergen. Another two tenths peeled out. The gap is 3.1 seconds. Bit of the traffic gone. Reinle makes it a little easier for him. Now car 17, Stephen Johnson opens up the gap. Lots of air there, no time penalty. Now it's on. It's officially on and literally for young and old. 3.4 seconds is the official margin. Win Cup is now 10.8 seconds off the lead, seven seconds away from Van Gisbergen. So he's just got to manage the best outcome he can here. It's still an important one. He's got a championship squarely in mind. This sort of battle continues to rage between the former teammates and former winners of the LNH. Oh, straight ahead, goes Tanda. ahead, Couldn't stop it down at turn four. There's a gift for Will Davison, fifth to fourth. The smallest of errors. There's something wrong with Van Gisbergen's car. I can hear him on the radio. This... Build up from passing those lap cars. He was on the radio then, extremely distressed. May have had something to do with those cars, but either way, those lap cars, they, either way, the gap is now 4.7 seconds. So it's starting to stretch back in Lowndes' favour. It was under three seconds just a blink ago. Now it's out towards five seconds, the difference. I reckon when he's gone offline, when he's gone offline to get around other cars, and you can see rubber coming... Oh, I don't know. 
is on, unhappy about stay something. Calm, mate. Stay calm. It might be pick up what we describe as pick up, which are little rubber balls that get on the tyres. It gives you the impression that you've got tyre damage, unless he does have some tyre damage. We saw a big chunk it's not of. Turning. It's not turning, so maybe it's got a drama at the front. Remember, we saw a result change here a couple of years ago with exactly that. It was uh, Craig Lowndes was the guy that got hurt at the time and the benefactor was Garth Tander. But he's saying it's not turning, it's vibrating, and he's very unhappy. What's the gap? It's now 5.3 seconds. We're 6.8 over wind cup and we're 5.1 to Lowndes. We've got six and a half laps to go, mate. Let's just try and manage it. Dave Stewart, wise counsel. The, he just, because they said we're ready for it, he said there's no way I'm coming in. That's how I picked up the message. So they've just uh, laid out for a moment, but they're taking everything back in. Second now is the, uh, is the aim, is the target for this young guy. There's the gap back to third. So this looks like the pressure's off. Lowndes and Scaife, 5.4 seconds. The elastic band is beginning to stretch again. Neil, and we can probably add as much to the drama here as what's wrong with uh, Shane's car as anyone can. Because I just noticed Ross and Jimmy Stone, they're not looking at the data, they're looking at the television vision in front of them to just see if, you know, typically that sort of feel from in the race driving seat is a tyre going flat, isn't it? So, uh, look, certainly looks alright on the vision. It might be a bit of pick-up. Nice and smooth, Shane, nice and smooth. We're 6.8 over wind cup. We've got six laps to go. Could be a bit of pick-up or he may have flat spotted a tyre. Or the other, perhaps the third alternative is it's just hurt the tyre of the big long stint and pushing hard, depending on the geometry at the front of that car. It's just total frustration coming out of the cockpit of car number nine. Now Gisbergen's just shouting back a whole lot of nothing in essence because he doesn't know what's going on. But see, you can tell he's got no pace because Carl Reindler, who he passed a couple of laps ago, is going to climb over him here. So, but it, it really, the fact is, Dave Stewart's right, even a third is a good outcome. You don't need a DNF, so you just got to take it easy, not overload this tyre, try and get the car home. And Dave Stewart has been... OK, Dave continues there, and just referencing, I don't know if you picked up the earlier part, what we can see on television. There's John McIntyre. So they're trying to counsel Shane Van Gisbergen just to hold on to that position because the reference is Jamie Wincup. I think that Wincup has enough to come and fight back and try and get this second position off him. Well, Jamie was about three tenths quicker to the first timing sector. They're just coming up to the second line now. He's got a long way to go with that, though. But you never know. It depends on how much this lap speed gets compromised in Shane's car, how much he's got to come out of it. What they don't want is a complete tyre fail. So what was a battle to try and to try and take down Craig Lowndes has now become a battle to try and hold off Jamie Wincup. There's a lot of very high speed curb running around here. We saw it when we were on, uh, on board with Jamie Wincup's car earlier, just what a pounding the tyre takes. It's easy to cut a tyre. It's easy to put a bit of damage into the wall around here at very high speed with very big loads. It may not be that, of course, there's lots and lots of other things that it could be. So. It's a big nail biter for all those guys because it's not something Mark Larkin made this reference. It's not really something that you'll see electronically. I mean, it's not going to pop up on a computer somewhere with a nice big answer in a placard. Gaps now 6.6 .6 seconds between Lowndes and Van Gisbergen. Right on the money there, mate. Um, Jimmy Stone just ran out onto the pit wall to try and visually see what was going on. I remember, as you said, there's a whole lot of other stuff under there. They've got quite an exotic rocker system, an anti-roll bar system. Could be a little failure of any type under there. Yeah, their, their geometry is quite a bit different than many others in the paddock. Different anti-roll bar mechanism in those cars. And uh, Jim, going back to the time on a tradition of, I'll go and have a look. Sometimes you can hear a flat spotted tyre pounding on the road as it goes by, if that is the issue. In fact, Larko, if you can still hear me, why don't you just go and stick your head over the fence at some stage and just see whether or not you can hear or spot anything, just in case, because you'll hear it if it is a flat spot at a pound on the road. And that's what Dave also, Dave Stewart, has been telling Shane Van Gisberg. We're having, a, li we're having a listen down the front straight. Yeah, Neil, already done that one, mate. I hung my head over there with the SBR boys, and uh, they're now all silence. Coming again. When they do have it, Matt and Barco has heard enough of them over the years. It's a, it's a real pitter-patter. It's quite a strange thing. 
But anyway, he stabilised his speed at the moment. And it's preservation for second. That's the main mission for him at the moment. Here's Russell Ingle. Down in 18th spot. A bit of a willing battle going on here. And car 18 goes off. James Moffat in the ditch. And we'll get back onto the grass. That's down at Siberia, turn five. There's Will Davison, who's chipping away at Jamie Wincup, trying to have a crack at a podium spot. He's catching him. Look at those green boxes down the bottom there. So that we saw a telling shot when we were all focused on Shane Van Gisbergen before, but the shot of Wincup into turn four, skating in on the rear brake, means that he doesn't exactly have a lot of firepower at the moment either. This is all, all a lovely story if you happen to be driving car 888 and your name's Lowndes or Scaife. So we'll watch that a couple of tenths faster to the last timing sector for Will Davison over Jamie Wincup. When you think back throughout this race and you go towards car 888, they fought their battles when they needed to. With the, the sun on the run into turn 12 there is really blinding just before they turn the car in. And I can just tell by how slowly they're coming out of the hole down there in turn 10, the short shift from second to third. They're battling with very little grip at this end of the day. They're driving the cars very conservatively. Now, lap time. Lowndes, 137.7. Van Gisbergen, 38.5. Wincup, 6.9. Davison, 6.7. So it's a 7.8 second margin, Lowndes to Van Gisbergen. Three seconds then back to Jamie Wincup. And we'll check these numbers for you. And then 2.3 back to Will. There they are. There's the leader. Ask and ye shall receive. There it is. Second. The other two cars are out of play. So there is third. Car 88. And there is Will Davison in fourth. Who's absolutely got the crosshairs now on car number 88. Really struggled with the balance of that car. Will Davison after taking on maximum fuel. Luke Yildon did a great job from the start from pole position. Continuing the run, however, the pole sitter is yet to win the LNH 500. And here's Jason Bright. Pompeo, you made mention of him earlier. He continues to push forward. Seventh spot now for Bright and Jones, starting from 22nd. Having a trip through pit, uh, pit lane for a black flag. Yeah, that's a huge comeback. It's been a good run to get him back in the top 10. So good strategy. They're usually pretty good with that down at Team BIC. Look at this. Look at this. It's all tightening up for the minor placings. Maybe the winner has half got a hand on the trophy, but you wouldn't want to pick second and third at the moment. Van Gisberg in the blue car. There's Wincup. And stalking Wincup is Davison. These guys all arguing. Van Gisbergen's got nothing left at the front of the car in terms of turn. Jamie Wincup was sliding unmercifully in the rear. And Davison looks like he's got reasonable balance after talking the fact, talking up the fact that his balance was average earlier in the race. A matter of seconds, a matter of seconds before Wincup gets this job done on Shane Van Gisbergen and goes up to second spot in the 500. Team Vodafone finished one two at Bathurst last okay, year. Mate, we've got coming up behind you as well. But it's been we'll seven years. We can. We'll still get a very good finish out of this. Just stay nice and calm. One and a half laps to go. Seven years since a one two finish at the 500. You have to go back to Sandown in 2004, where SBR did it. Now, Will Davison having a look, a big look at Shane Van Gisbergen. So, Will wants a spot on this podium. And he'll look down the inside off the top of this hill. He's under the wing now. Shane moves a little to the right. Will look. Oh, he's given him one. He's covered him. And now down the inside. Third spot for the trading post Falcon of Davison and Yildon. Now, the big question here is whether or not Davison's got enough to grab Win Cup. One lap. 4.45 kilometres will answer that question. Lowndes in control. He's seen off the best of them. Had a terrific battle with Garth Tander. 
Then he had the youngster charging at him, breathing down his neck. He fought both of those battles off. They weren't easy, but he has held on and Mark Scaife can afford to shake hands and start the celebrations because it's a 10 second gap. So the minor placings are really still up in the air, although Jamie Winkup has got the foot down from Will Davison. Craig Lowndes, he came good at the right time of the year at the Queensland Raceway with three straight wins. This will make it four wins in a row. Hasn't been done since mid last year when James Courtney was on a roll. And it will mean that Mark Scaife gets his 90th career race win. And they, if this happens, and it looks like it's going to in a matter of seconds, they remain undefeated in this recent string of getting together in endurance races. It's a remarkable outcome. Well, what has quite clearly become the ultimate pairing in the V8 supercars. Around turn 12. On to Gardner Strait, 113 laps done. Craig Lowndes and Mark Scaife. Keep the enduro streak going. Look out Bathurst, here they come again. And a one-two finish as Jamie Wincup and Andrew Thompson celebrate second. Third to Ford performance racing and it's gonna go down to the wire. Whoa, Gartander gets ahead of Shane Van Gisbergen. How's Tander and Van Gisbergen at the end? That was amazing. And an amazing drive from this guy. Scaifey, firstly, well done, mate. Outstanding effort. After finishing his stellar career, mate, bit of a dream come true. Three times you've parked your butt in this car and won three races. Oh, look, it's just unbelievable, Arco. Um, I've never seen him drive as well. You know, he's really at the top of his game. And it's such an unbelievable team effort again. I mean, a one-two of this sort of race, you know how tough it is. It's unbelievable. It's, uh, it's a dream come true. Yeah, hats off to you, mate. But you have. You've made a great contribution to the team. And it must be a ripper outfit. But you're putting your bit in and well done, mate. Good to see you. Thank you, buddy. Really appreciate it. Thanks, a very solid first stint, and they just did a carbon copy of what they did last year. <laughs> Craig Lowndes sending out the smoke signals that Mount Panorama is their next target. Assuming he doesn't fry that car in between now and then. They certainly didn't do it the easy way because there were times in this race where the racing level was in extraordinary highs. Gartander was in that picture. Shane Van Gisbergen was in that picture. Jamie Wincup was in that picture. Provisional results for race 19, the LNH 500, Lowndes and Scaife, Wincup and Thompson and our pole sitters, Will Davison and Luke Yildon, finish in third spot. What about that for car two? Position four for Nick Perkat and Garth Tander after starting in pit lane and Shane Van Gisbergen. Well, he was so close to getting his first endurance victory for the carefree Kiwis of the Gears and John McIntyre. Again, run the form line through Bathurst in three weeks' time and make sure you put that pairing as part of your picks. Winterbottom and Richards. Didn't go their way, but uh, the signs are okay. Alex Davison and David Brabham will need to regroup big time before they head to the mountain because they just couldn't put a finger on it this time. So Craig Lowndes has now won eight races on this circuit. Mark Scaife has now won nine. Back-to-back -back LNH 500 victories. An endurance streak that started here last year, went up to Bathurst and took the Peter Brock Trophy. Come back here and do it again and they will head once more to Mount Panorama as not only defending champions, but the favourites. There's Jamie Winkup. Just a slight 
The difference in pit lane when Andrew Thompson couldn't get that door open for the driver change. When Team Vodafone rewind this race and go back, they will see that that cost them enough to leave Jamie Wincup a few seconds adrift. It's a game of inches. A dynamic duo. Lowndes and Scaife do it again. Davison and Perkat, the leading Ford. And a good turnaround too for Ford Performance Racing after a tough run on the soft tyre compound. They were looking for a, a change and they got it here in the hard tyre races. Well, Craig Lowndes just celebrating with his team and Mark Scape who's here as well. Lowndes, congratulations back to back. Great job, you boys. No, not bad for an old fart. <laughs> Couple of great beers. Hey, Matty White was saying earlier, since you two got together, you again, you're undefeated. Nice record. Oh, look, it's fantastic. We both love the place. It's, look, it's, a, it's an emotional place. And to drive with him again is look, sensational. Um, and one more big race to go, boys. One more big one. I think you know which one it is. <laughs> I do. <laughs> uh, what do you take away from today? I mean, that's a real milestone to go back to back here. Oh, look, it's unbelievable. Uh, to have a one, two also, Brett's. I mean, it's an unbelievable team effort, and uh, the guys, guys have just uh, done an extraordinary job. Outstanding, boys. We'll celebrate on the podium. Thanks, well done. Mate. Thanks, Brett. Thanks. Teammate Jamie Wincup and Andrew Thompson as well finishing in second place. Jamie, you held on. You kept fighting all the way. That's a great result. <laughs> We find that Mark Scaife, we're going to poke him in the eye, he, he ran into us at the start and the door wouldn't open, but um, no, those guys, Triple Eight, Craig and uh, Scaife, they did a phenomenal job, they were the best partners to partnership today, and Tomo, couldn't be happy with him, he, uh, he, he gave, handed over the car in first, so I uh, couldn't have asked for any more. Yeah, Tomo, it was a great setup. well done there early on. Yeah, no, I had a great uh, first sort of two stints, so, you know, I was shame about that door, just couldn't get it open, I used my foot to try to jam anything open, so, uh, yeah, I'm with Jamie, we'll, uh, we'll sort Scaife out tonight. <laughs> Oh, well, good luck with that. Hey, Shane Van Gisbergen gave you a great contest there in the late stages. Yeah, hey, he was quick, but, um, you know, Phillip Island's hard on tyres. Thanks, Larry. Um, hard on tyres, so it's just hard to get, make sure you get 40 laps out of it. But um, fortunately for him, he's had a, uh, he had a tyre issue. I've been on the receiving end of that a couple of times myself. So, um, yeah, that's the way it goes. Great day, boys. Well done. Enjoy the podium. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. The Ford Performance Racing is Will Davison and Luke Yildon. Guys, well done. Started up the front, then you brought it home for a podium finish. Well done, Will. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this is this is all we're good for today. So it's a great great result for FPR. We've had a good weekend. We've had a poll. You know, Luke led some races early and did an absolutely awesome job. We didn't quite have the speed at certain phases of the race, um, but the, the speed at the end of the stints was quite strong. And you never give up. You never say die. We dropped back to fifth, but but uh, I hunted a few down at the end there and we got back on the podium. So, wrap for the boys. They deserve a bit of champagne and uh, obviously Lukey as well. So, bring on Bathurst. Yeah, look, it was a great team effort, wasn't it? The two of you have come together fantastically. Yeah, it's working unbelievably well. Like, like I said, we've known Will for a long time. Mr. Race against him in Formula Ford and it's good to be paired up with him now in the trading post of FPR Falcon. It was good to lead some laps there early. Uh, like Will both said, it was unfortunate. We didn't quite have the pace at certain stages there, but we got there in the end. Would you like to taste some champagne? Yeah, bring it on. Why not? <laughs> Let's go to the podium. <laughs> Will Davison's moved up a couple of spots in the championship picture as well. He came into this weekend eighth, and he has gone up to sixth. Matty, down here with uh, David Stewart. David, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen's engineer. So close, but so far, mate. 13 laps out. We were doing the numbers. We thought he had it nailed. Yeah, look, we had some really good pace there uh, in that last stint. Um, we, we needed to get some track position. And we did that over sort of the last third of the race. Shane did a great job, a absolutely fantastic. Really disappointed uh, not to be standing on the podium. And I, I thought, you know, we could have probably taken it to Craig at the end there. Uh, but, you know, that's the way it rolls sometimes. Uh, everybody at Stone Brothers has done a great job to get uh, the car to where it is today. And, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to Bathurst. And I reckon you should be, Dave. I reckon you're in good shape. Take it there, mate. Good on you. Thanks, Mark. Great effort from Shane Van Gisbergen and John McIntyre. But Lowndes and Scaife have done it again here at the LNH 500.